Uh, today we have Colleen Christians, who is a 20-year-old Muslim, uh, who is a very knowledgeable as well, and uh, we would like to welcome him to the room, who is going to debate uh, Anthony Rogers. Um, Anthony Rogers is actually an author for Answering Islam and Answering Muslims. Uh, he is a friend of the, the writer David Wood, and he has also, I understand, been a guest on ABN TV. And a lot of you know him, and a lot of you know Colin Christens. We would like to welcome them both to the room, and we would also like to share with you their topic today. Uh, Anthony Rogers will present the proposition and the question to be asked as well. Does the Old Testament teach that the angel of the Lord is a distinct divine person in the Godhead? That is the question and the topic for the debate tonight. To begin, we will have opening statements. Um, supporting the proposition, we will have Anthony Rogers, 20 minutes, and then we will have uh, opposing the proposition, calling Christians for 20 minutes. After that, I will take the mic before you begin cross-examination. Let's go ahead and begin with Anthony Rogers. Thank you for joining us. Okay, I want to begin by giving all praise and thanks to God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the God from whom, through whom, and for whom all things exist, he who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Second, I extend my greetings to all those who were chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and effectually called to faith by the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, I'd like to greet Ijaz Ahmed, a.k.a. Calling Christians, my opponent, Waduha, who has agreed to moderate this debate, and all the other Muslims and anyone else who might be listening. My prayer for you all is that you embrace God's saving mercy as it is offered in Jesus Christ alone, the Father's divine messenger and son. And short of that, I pray for you any good in life that is consistent with God's love and thrice holy character. With that said, I want to state clearly at the outset the thesis I'll be defending in this debate, and which my opponent will necessarily have to direct his remarks to if he wants to avoid attacking a straw man or position I do not hold. The thesis I'll be defending is simply this. The angel of Yahweh is a distinct divine person in the Godhead according to the Old Testament. Notice that my thesis entails both the deity of the angel as well as his distinct personhood from another and or other persons in the Godhead. This means that it will not be sufficient or at all relevant for my opponent to argue that the angel is distinct from Yahweh as if this somehow negates my position. In fact, any good argument my opponent puts forward to prove that the angel is distinct from another person called Yahweh will receive a quick and robust amen from me. This also means that my opponent will necessarily have to either show that the angel is not also identified as God, as I will argue, or provide some way of accounting for how the angel may be so identified that is consistent with Unitarianism, the belief that God is only one person, and the Old Testament. With all of that said, my opening case for the deity and distinct personality of the angel of the Lord will cover three issues. First, the definition of the Hebrew word translated angel. Second, the proper translation of the entire phrase, Melach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. And third, exegetical evidence that the angel of the Lord is a fully divine person who is distinct from another and or other persons called Yahweh. It is to the first of these three points, then, that I now turn. It's usually necessary at the outset of any debate to define one's terms, and that's certainly the case when it comes to the word angel in our discussion. While it's common today to associate the word angel exclusively with heavenly creatures, the etymological and lexical evidence show that the underlying Hebrew word, melach, does not have this restricted meaning. The word melach actually derives from a verbal stem that means to depute or send a messenger, which is attested in Ugarit as well as other South Semitic languages. True to its etymological moorings, as all Hebrew lexicons agree, the noun melach simply means a messenger, 
As such, it can be used of heavenly beings, Genesis 32.1, human beings, Genesis 32.3, and even impersonal things like a pestilence, 2 Kings 19.35, or the wind, Psalm 104.4. In fact, as the parallelism of Ecclesiastes 5.6 demonstrates, and as the Jewish translators of the Septuagint well understood, the word can even be used for God. The same thing can be seen in Malachi 3.1, where the Lord, Ha-Adon, is called the Angel of the Covenant, or the Messenger of the Covenant. For the etymological evidence of this, one can consult, for example, Volume 8 of the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, edited by Helmer Ringgren, or to the detailed evidence provided by James Battenfield in his book, An Exegetical Study of the Melach Yahweh. As for the lexical evidence, one needs look no further than Gesenius, the father of all Hebrew lexicons, or to the lexicon of Brown, Driver, and Briggs. The implications of all this for present purposes are simply this. Inasmuch as the word means a messenger, and as such can be used of different orders of beings, whether heavenly or earthly, personal or impersonal, divine or created, the word does not by itself tell us anything about the nature of anyone or anything called an angel or messenger. To put it another way, the word is functional rather than ontological, and the nature of any messenger or angel must therefore be determined by the context in which it is used. As I will maintain, when the scriptures talk about the angel or the messenger of Yahweh in particular, they are not talking about any ordinary or created messenger, but a fully divine person. According to numerous scholars, such as Dorothy Irvin in her book Metherion, The Comparison of Tales from the Old Testament in the Ancient Near East, or S. A. Meyer in his essay simply called Angel in the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, or in his larger work entitled The Messenger in the Ancient Semitic World, or Gunther Junker in his doctoral dissertation on Jesus and the Angel of the Lord. All of them and others, based on their own independent studies comparing the way the word angel or melach is used in the Ancient Near East and in the Bible, conclude that the melach Yahweh speaks and acts in the same way as the deity in the uh, the extra-biblical Near Eastern narratives, and therefore that the word as used for the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, particularly in the Torah, is a narratologically sophisticated way of speaking about Yahweh. For the sake of time, I will simply quote one of the aforementioned works, and will happily quote the others if my opponent requests. In the aforementioned essay by S.A. Meyer, he states, and I quote, It is frequently asserted that messengers, when delivering their messages, often do not distinguish between themselves and the one who sent them. It is true that messengers do speak in the first person, as if they were the sender of the message. But it's crucial to note that such speech in unequivocal messenger context is always preceded by a prefatory comment along the lines of, so-and-so said to you, after which the message is provided. Thus, a messenger clearly identifies the words of the one who sent the message. A messenger would subvert the communication process were he or she to fail to identify the one who sent the messenger on his or her mission. In text, never a question as to who is speaking, whether it be the messenger or the one who sent the messenger. There is, therefore, no evidence for the frequently made assertion that messengers need not make any distinction between themselves and the one who sent them. The only context in biblical and ancient Near Eastern literature where no distinction seems to be made between sender and messenger occur in the case of the angel of the Lord. It is precisely the lack of differentiation that occurs with this figure and this figure alone among messengers that raise the question as to whether he is even a messenger of God at all. It must be underscored that the angel of Yahweh in these perplexing biblical narratives does not behave like any other messenger known in the divine or human realm. Although the term messenger is present, the narrative itself omits the indispensable features of messenger activity and presents instead the activities which one associates with Yahweh or the gods of the ancient Near East. End quote. That's page 49. Now, having established the etymology and meaning of the term and its usage for the angel of Yahweh, uh, I need to say something about the proper translation of the entire phrase, Melach Yahweh. In Hebrew, nouns and their modifiers are in agreement, such that if Yahweh is definite, then Melach is definite as well. Since Yahweh is a proper noun, according to the rules of Hebrew grammar, it is intrinsically and therefore always definite. In other words, the grammatical construction of Melach Yahweh in Hebrew, where the second noun, a proper noun, Yahweh, is definite, requires that the first noun, Melach, which is in the construct state, be understood in a definite way as well. This means that the phrase should invariably be translated, as it typically is, the angel of Yahweh, and not, as some people would wish, an angel or a angel of Yahweh. Adding to the significance of this is the fact that the phrase never appears in the plural. The Old Testament never uses the phrase in the plural. It never uses the phrase Malachim Yahweh. The angel alone is denominated by the title Melach Yahweh. 
The reasons why this is significant should be readily apparent. Number one, it shows that the person denominated by this title is unique, as S.A. Meyer pointed out, being singled out from all other messengers as not simply a messenger, but the messenger par excellence. And two, it shows that we are dealing with one and the same person or agent in every instance where this phrase is used from Genesis on, which shows that the angel cannot be a mere phantasm, emanation, or personification, as some have argued. In fact, in light of the exegetical case I'll offer momentarily, I would even argue that the grammar of the passage can be pressed still further to yield uh, a meaning that is more precise than even this. A case can be made for the fact that of the many different kinds of construct relationships, the one that applies in the case of the phrase Melach Yahweh is the appositional or definitional construct, which means that the second word, Yahweh, actually identifies or defines the first, Melach. The resulting translation should then be, as Douglas Stewart points out in his commentary on Exodus, the messenger that is Yahweh. But I don't need to press this point. It's sufficient to observe that the phrase is definite and proceed from there and make my case on an exegetical basis. And that brings me finally to the issue of just who the messenger of Yahweh is. Who is the messenger of Yahweh according to the Old Testament? Rather than employ a shotgun approach and riddle my opponent with passage after passage, uh, which teaches that the angel is a distinct divine person, which I could easily do since the evidence is so plentiful, I'll provide something of an extended exegesis of one passage, Genesis 16, verses 7 through 14. Genesis 16 then finds Hagar having fled from uh, Sarai, her mistress. And we begin in verse 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him and he will live to the east of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are God who sees. He remained alive here after seeing him. For the well was called Be'er Lahai Roi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. End quote. Four times in this passage, mention is made of the angel of the Lord, verses 7, 9, 10, and 11. The first mention tells us that this encounter was initiated by the angel rather than by Hagar. He found or revealed himself to her. She didn't find or discover him. The other three mentions tell us that the angel is the one who spoke to her. For all that, it's important to observe that while the narrator of Genesis tells us, the readers, that it was the angel of the Lord who appeared and spoke to her, nothing is directly said by the angel to Hagar about who he is. Instead, he appears on a sudden and calls her by name. This in itself indicates to us, or at least would have indicated to Hagar, that she was not dealing with any ordinary individual. For this one who appeared unannounced like a thunderbolt out of the blue, uh, was intimately acquainted with her. Indeed, he not only knows Hagar and calls her by name, but he even knows that she is the maid of Sarai and presumes the prerogative of commanding Hagar to return and submit to her mistress. But, and no doubt to the greater surprise of Hagar, not only does he know her name and not only does he presume the authority to issue imperatives to her, but he even knows that there is a child in her womb and orders her to name him Ishmael, trumping the rights of both Hagar and Abraham, whose natural child he was. Most spectacular of all, this unannounced visitor tells Hagar what will become of her child in the future and issues an unprecedented promise in the first person, saying, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too, too many to count. The cumulative effect of all this, his intimate knowledge of her, that her name is Hagar, that she's the maid of Sarai, that she's a child in her womb, uh, the order to name him Ishmael, the foresight as to what kind of person the child would be, and in particular, the first person declaration or promise that he would multiply her descendants, a divine work that presupposes divine power, leads Hagar to conclude that her unannounced and uninvited visitor, who presumes divine authority and issues divine promises, is none other than God. For verse 13 tells us that she named him Quote, you are God who sees me. In fact, not only does Hagar come to the conclusion that the one speaking to her is a divine person, God who sees me, the one who knows her uh, uh, and, uh, through and through, but he, the narrator himself refers to him as Yahweh. Notice in verse 13, it says, she gave this name to Yahweh, or the Lord, who spoke to her. The underlying Hebrew term used here for Lord is Yahweh. So the one Hagar calls God who sees me, the narrator refers to as Yahweh. 
In other words, this is what we have what we have here is what theologians call a theophany, an act of condescending grace whereby God temporarily assumed a visible form in order to converse with one of his creatures who otherwise would have died if they saw him in his actual and full all-consuming glory, as we see in the case of Moses in Exodus 33. For even though Moses spoke face to face with God, he was told that he could not see God in all the fullness of his glory and live. Now, this does uh, altogether away with later attempts on the part of post-Christian uh, apostate Jews and others who try to say either that Hagar was mistaken when she concluded that it was God who spoke to her, or those who attempt to say that the angel is merely a created agent who speaks in God's name. For it was not only Hagar who identified this agent as very God, but the sacred author of Genesis. And the author of Genesis does not say that the angel of the Lord that Hagar identified as God was really only a created messenger speaking for the Lord, as if this was some sort of law of agency in play here, but tells us rather that the messenger was the Lord himself. Quote, she gave this name to Yahweh who spoke to her. And because it was God who spoke to her, we are further told in verse 14 that the well at which he appeared to her was named Be'er Lachai Roi, which means the well of the living one who sees me. As many scholars observe, this is an act of honor and worship, one that often follows a divine human encounter, such as we see in the case of Abraham, who names the place where the Lord, the angel of the Lord, appeared to him Yahweh Yaira which means Yahweh will provide, or Jacob, who renames the place where the angel of the Lord appeared to him Bethel, which means the house of God. And for all of that, the Bible still clearly distinguishes this undeniably divine person from another person who is called Yahweh. Indeed, in this very passage, a distinction of persons is evident. For not only does the angel speak as God in the first person, promising to do what only God can do, which led Hagar to conclude what the author of Genesis confirms to be the case that he is Yahweh God, but he also speaks about the Lord in the third person, in verse 11. Quote, Behold, you are with child and will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Unquote. Now, based on passages such as this, it ought to be unsurprising to discover that there's copious evidence from the second temple Jews believed in a second divine person. In the extra-biblical Jewish literature, the angel of the Lord was called by various names. For example, Philo referred to him as the divine word and son of God, phrases Christians will be very familiar with. In his book called Questions and Answers on Genesis, part 3, section 27, he refers to the angel of the Lord who appeared to Hagar as the divine Logos. He says the same thing about the one who appeared to Hagar in his book on Flight and Finding, chapter 5. And it wasn't just Philo, the most prominent leader of the Jews in Alexandria, who taught this, but Jews in Babylon and Palestine to boot, as evidenced by the ancient Targums, the Jewish paraphrases of the Old Testament into Aramaic. When we look at the ancient Targums, we see that one of the ways ancient Jews referred to the angel of the Lord was as the Memra. The Aramaic expression Memra means word, just like the Greek word Logos that was used by Philo. So according to the Targums, it was the word who appeared to Hagar and spoke to her. For example, in the Jerusalem Targum, the relevant portion of Genesis 16 is paraphrased as follows. Quote, and Hagar gave thanks and prayed in the name of the word of the Lord who had been revealed to her. End quote. In another Targum, the Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan, the angel of the Lord is not only referred to as the Memra, the word, but also as the Shechanah, the dwelling of God among men. Quote, and she gave thanks before the Lord whose word spoke to her. For behold, she said, here is revealed the glory of the Shechanah of the Lord after a vision. Unquote. Moreover, in the Targum of Onkelos, he's referred to as the angel of the covenant, a term, interestingly enough, that is only used in the Masoretic text for the Lord, Ha'edon in Malachi 3.1. Uh, here's the quote from the Targum of Onkelos, quote, she prayed in the name of the Lord who had spoken with her, and then it says she gave this name to the, uh, she named the well at which she appeared, the angel of the covenant, unquote. What all of this shows us is that there were Jews in ancient times who understood the angel to be a distinct person, and who at the same time identified him as deity, the divine word, the Lord, the angel of the covenant, the Shekhanah, the very presence of God, something also associated with the Holy Spirit, by the way. As Dr. Camila Helena von Hein states in her book, The Messenger of the Lord and Early Jewish Interpretations of Genesis, published by Walter de Gruder in 2010, on pages 271 and 72, quote, the biblical ambivalence between the angel and God remains in the Targum. As in the Bible, the angel refers to God in the third person, but he also talks with divine authority in the first person. The angel of the Lord who spoke to Hagar seems to be identified by her in the Targum of Onkelos as God himself in verse 13. In accordance with the Masoretic text, you are the God who sees everything, unquote. Von Hein goes on to make similar comments about the Targums of Neophyte, Pseudo-Jonathan, and the fragmentary Targums. 
Now, it's for reasons such as this that scholars of the present have, by and large, come full circle, jettisoning the views of men like G.F. Moore, who capitulated to the view of Maimonides, a late medieval rabbi, and have held by such able men as B.F. Westcott, Alfred Edersheim, G.H. Box, Osterley Kohler, and others, that the memory of the Targums, the Logos of Philo, and the various cognomens by which he is denominated in other intertestamental and later Jewish rit literature, rooted and grounded as they all are in the Old Testament personage, personage of the angel of the Lord, that all of this provides copious evidence that Jews of the Second Temple period, Jews before, during, and even after the time of the advent of the Word of God in the flesh, did in fact believe, as the Old Testament uh, teaches, that the angel of the Lord is a distinct divine person in the Godhead. Liberal scholar and theologian Dr. Margaret Barker, a longtime member and one-time president of the Society for Old Testament Study, with whom I have many disagreements, which is par for the course since she's a liberal, serves as an example for this. Uh, she says in her book, uh, The Great Angel, on page three, quote, what has become clear to me time and time again is that the evidence points consistently in one direction and indicates that pre-Christian Judaism was not monotheistic in the sense that we use that word. The roots of Christian Trinitarian theology lie in pre-Christian Palestinian beliefs about the angels, unquote. And so to conclude, I have shown that the Melach Yahweh is differentiated from an Another person called Yahweh insofar as he speaks about Yahweh in the third person. I've also shown that he is Yahweh in his own right insofar as he is himself the bearer of the divine name of Yahweh and the divine title El Roi, uh, speaks as God in the first person, is ascribed divine attributes, performs divine works, exercises divine prerogatives, and is given the honor and worship that belong to God alone. And so if I may take a page from the playbook of the late Oxford scholar C.S. Lewis, the angel of the Lord, the Melach Yahweh, is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so he is. Amen. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony Rogers. Uh, next we have uh, Calling Christians with your response. Right, can I get a one please inshallah, can I get a one? 20 minutes, that is correct, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, alright. When the timer begins, I'll start. Alright, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Rabbish rahli sadwi, wa yasir li amri, wa hlul uqdatan min lisani, yafkahu qawli. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayyuhal adhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallam. La ilaha illallah al-lazim al-halim. La ilaha illallah rabbil awsh al-lazim. La ilaha illallah rabbil samawati wa rabbil awd wa rabbil awsh al-kareem. Ameen. Well, I couldn't believe Anthony's arguments. I didn't expect for him to quote word for word his three-year-old and two-year-old articles, which my poster will post for me now. Word for word, if I wanted to do that, I would have, well, written a response to his articles. So, Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 20. Do people make their own gods? Yes, but they are not gods. If only the Christian faith had heeded those very words, we would not have a need to be here tonight. Unfortunate as it is, it should not have come as a surprise that Antony would be trying to argue that an angel is a god. Let's dive it momentarily and take a step back, so that we may be able to build some perspective. Firstly, they've made a man into a god, that being Jesus, the son of Mary. They furthered this by making Mary a god. Well, at least the Catholics and Coloridians did. They continued by making animals into God. For example, remember that Jesus, who is a God, is a lamb and a mother hen. The Holy Spirit, who is also a God, took the form of a dove. Yet they did not stop there. Eventually, they even made themselves into God. Some of them literally applying the label son of God, daughter of God, or child of God to themselves. They all, however, claim that the Holy Spirit, who is a God, is inside each and every one of them. Lastly, in their fervor and zealous craze, they've even worshipped the foreskin of a man, that is, the holy purpose. Now, taking all of the previous examples into perspective, it was only a matter of time before they turned to worship another creation of God, and today they've made an angel into God. How striking and highly ironic are Jeremiah's words now. Now, there are some questions that need to be addressed, especially in 
in light of the t given topic. That is so we can clarify Anthony's rationale. To begin with, he would have to demonstrate for us where the Godhead is referred to and how it is defined in the Old Testament. After all, his argument is dependent on the positive affirmation of the topic. It is most imperative that he takes the initiative to fully demonstrate his premises and not have himself or ourselves assume beliefs of his doctrine on his behalf. And if it is that he refuses to do so, wouldn't that then mean that he is appealing to the fallacy of which wealth thinking. Secondly, he'd have to define what a person in the Godhead is and why an angel seemingly has to be equated with God's stature. Lastly, since Christian theology presupposes that each member of the Godhead is co-equal, how can an angel of the Lord, a term which by very definition promotes a hierarchy, not fall into the fallacy of the law of non-contradiction? Would Anthony have us believe that the secretary of the CEO is co-equal to the CEO? That the wife of that the son of a wife is a wife, that the husband of a woman is a woman? The answer is yes, and by no means would a sane, sober and safe sapient person accept such an argument. Now this concept that being that the angel of the Lord is a divine being firstly gained providence and prominence in Christian theology with the advent of the second century work of Justin Martyr's A Dialogue with Trifle. Now, Antony is no different to the majority of Christendom who have argued this aspect of their Christology. In his article, The Malak Yahweh, Jesus the Divine Messenger of the Old Testament, Part 1, in his third citation, he clearly indicates that Justin Martyr's work is where he has mendaciously and quite predictably sourced his argumentation from. With that said, it should now be known that most Christians would appeal to the work of Justin Martyr and use the same verses with the same primitive, incoherent, inconsistent, incomprehensible and intellectually fraudulent eisegesis. It is almost certain, and well, he proved this, that Antony's arguments will flow as such. Premise 1. The angel of the Lord will have to claim divinity for himself. Premise 2. The angel of the Lord did acts that God would do. Premise 3. The angel of the Lord was worshipped. The conclusion, therefore, being that the angel of the Lord must be God. However, if we take his premises apart and analyze them one by one, we'd soon find a lot of non-sequitur arguments being presented. To begin with, let's examine premise 1 and 2, which both read, The angel of the Lord claimed divinity for himself, and the angel of the Lord did acts that God would do. To the lesser learned, this might seem quite obvious. After all, in some instances, we read that the angel of the Lord speaks as if he were God. One example in Judges chapter 6 verse 12, uh, when we read it, angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now who is it that is with Gideon? The angel of the Lord. Yet the verse claims that the Lord was with Gideon. We read again in Exodus chapter 3 verses 2 and 6, there, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So this presents the illusion that the angel of the Lord is speaking in the first person as if he were God, as well as physically representing God. At this point, it appears to be clear that the angel of the Lord must be a member in the Godhead. He must be a divine person. That is, until we actually read the Tanakh properly and in its full context. To begin with, the angel of the Lord is defined by Antony in his article, uh, the Malak Yahweh, Jesus, divine messenger of the Old Testament, part 1, which reads, and I quote, the Malak Yahweh, Jesus, um, sorry, uh, which reads, and I quote, the word that is used in the Hebrew text is malak. The lexical sources are unanimous that the Hebrew word malak in its original signification and as it is used in the Bible means one sent, a messenger. End quote. This is from Antony's article himself. Now this presents the first of many problems for Antony. His argumentation is used in the reductive fallacy. In his reading or interpretation, the term Malak Yahweh becomes Yahweh. He superimposes his belief on the verses I have mentioned, thus negating the word Malak completely, or to some extent removing its meaning completely. Let's reread Judges chapter 6 verse 12 with Antony's definition of Malak Yahweh. When the messenger of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, 
the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Who is up here, who appeared to Gideon? The messenger of the Lord. So now we have some context. It is a messenger speaking on behalf of the Lord. Something which is known to Jews and known to those who read the Tanakh. It's mentioned in Exodus, Exodus chapter 23 verse 22. For if you hearken to his voice and do all that I say, whose voice? Who is I? That is Yahweh. I, Yahweh, will hate your enemies and oppress your adversaries. So here we have Yahweh stating that the angel is speaking on God's behalf. Therefore this messenger, whenever he speaks, is speaking on behalf of the Lord. This puts to rest the claim that the angel of the Lord can claim divinity himself. Rather, he is speaking on behalf of the Lord at all times. And with that in mind, it would therefore be obvious uh, uh, that the angel of the Lord who is speaking on the Lord's behalf would have knowledge or would present knowledge uh, that God would know such as in Genesis chapter 16 verses 7 to 14 he is speaking on behalf of the Lord and the Lord would know these things about Hagar so that makes sense why the angel of the Lord would present information to Hagar that only the Lord will know now some might argue if the angel of the Lord does speak on behalf of the Lord why does he have to speak in first person this can be answered with the Judaic concept of the law of agency this law which Antony does concede to be valid and which he does reference in his series of articles the Malak Yahweh and which Sam Shimon, another author on the Answering Islam website, he as well accedes to this in his articles, uh, the Lord Jesus, the glorious messenger of the Lord. Uh, so the Jewish Encyclopedia defines this law as being, uh, defines this act of, uh, sorry, this law of agency as being an agent, it's called Shalia in Hebrew. So the law of agency references the angel of the Lord who is a shalia or an agent on behalf of the Lord. And the main point of the Jewish law of agency is expressed in the dictum, a person's agent is regarded as the person himself. So the angel is representing Yahweh. The angel is representing who? Yahweh. Therefore, any act committed by a duly appointed agent is regarded as having been committed by the principal who therefore bears full responsibility for it with consequent complete absence of liability on the part of the agent. So that explains why the people, when they address Yahweh, when they address the angel of the Lord, they would speak in first person to him because the angel of the Lord is representing God. Just as when uh, Moses comes and he sees the burning bush. You know, he covers his eyes, he covers his face, so he doesn't see who's in the burning bush. Because he thinks that it's God, because he's hearing God's words to him. The person is speaking as if they are God. But we see later on that numerous people, including Jacob, Hagar, they see God. They, sorry, they see the angel of the Lord. So if Moses thought that he couldn't see God, how can Hagar see God? It's not with, therefore the person who is the angel of the Lord can't be God because Moses on instinct when he heard the voice of God he heard this person speaking to him he assumed it would be God but that person was actually the angel of the Lord representing God and that is why he was able to converse through this person uh, this therefore gives the pretext and the rational reason reasoning for the angel of the Lord to use first person speech. To put this in a modern day setting, let's refer to the parable of a coma. Let's say his name is David. David has been in a coma. He's been brain dead for 30 years. He awakes and the nurse attends to him. She calls his mistress on her cell phone and puts, on, and puts her on speakerphone. David has never seen a cell phone. Already he's suspicious. David's mistress answers and says, Honey, are you there? Answer me. Now David is freaked out. He throws the phone on the floor and wants to know why the box sounds like his wife and is speaking like his wife. It's almost as if she's the device itself. See, we can excuse David because he doesn't have the knowledge to know that this phone is an interface, a device through which one person can communicate with another. When using a cell phone, this communication interface, both the caller and the receiver speak in the first person through the usage of the device. Similarly, when the angel of the Lord is spoken to, this, the people speaking to the angel are speaking as if they are speaking to the Lord as it is the Lord who is speaking to them through the angel. One example of this is in Genesis chapter 16 verse 13 where Hagar addresses Yahweh through the angel or messenger.
Now, Anthony is a person we cannot excuse. Anthony is like the comatose man from the parable, like the brain dead man. But he's a tad bit worse because he accepts that Malak means messenger and not God. He knows that the messenger is an interface for God to communicate to whomever he wants, but he still insists that the messenger and the source of the message is the same. So let's derive an easier parable here for Anthony. Uh, so there's a, there's a parable of a man named Sam. So Sam goes to a restaurant and upon complete, completing his meal, he calls the waiter, he calls the waiter who is a server, and well we'd expect him to say, send my compliments to the chef. Instead he says to the server, thank you for cooking this wonderful meal. Now there's the problem. The server merely served the meal. He's the means through which the meal was delivered. He's not the source. Anthony now is like this man. He knows what the word server means. He knows that this person delivers the meal, but still he insists on claiming the server is the chef. With those parables in mind, let's refer to the angel of the Lord again. In Zechariah chapter 1, he is speaking and he says, The angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these seventy years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Then the angel, who by the way is the angel of the Lord, was speaking to me, said, Proclaim this word, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous with Jerusalem and Zion, and I am very angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but they went too far with the punishment. Note that the Lord is speaking to Malach Yahweh. He is addressing the questions of Malach Yahweh. If it is that the Malach Yahweh and Yahweh are the same being, that is God, as Anthony has argued, and that the angel of the Lord is the Lord, then why is the angel addressing the God as Lord Almighty? Since when this God, who is also an angel, called God, who in this case is not an angel, God. That they are not co-equal. Secondly, we see that angel that the angel is conversing with God. Now, unless this can be diagnosed as multiple personality disorder or perhaps schizophrenia, these are two different beings, one a God, one an angel, conversing with one another. Lastly, note that at this time in the passage, the words, this is what the Lord Almighty says, are included. They are indicating that the angel is again, as always, speaking on behalf of someone else. If the angel was speaking on behalf of himself, why then why would he have to include the same? Statement, this is what the Lord Almighty says. If he was the Lord Almighty, why does he have to say this is what the Lord Almighty says? Clearly there are two different beings, two different persons completely. This goes to show that while this was understood throughout the Tanakh, this understanding that when the angel speaks, it is the Lord's words, was implicit and not needed to be made external at all the time. If something is understood, it doesn't have the need to be mentioned constantly. So that's one reason you're not going to see this is what the Lord Almighty says every time the angel of the Lord speaks. It's an implicit uh, statement that's understood by the people who at that time who were conversing with the angel of the Lord. From this I must ask, does Anthony's logic and comprehension take into consideration the word redundancy? If I for a moment were to accept Anthony's argument as valid, this would mean that God created angels who are Malak, that is to be messengers, and God the all-powerful and never changing, then decides to become a Malak of himself. That's like saying Anthony buys a cell phone to speak to his wife when he's at work, so one day while at work, he decides to talk with her. So he whips out his cell phone, puts it on his desk and runs across town to talk to his wife instead. What's the logic with that? Continuing from this, I have to ask, how does Anthony how does Anthony hear from when the angel is speaking on behalf of himself instead on behalf of Yahweh? Does he have any sort of criteria, method or formula? He has to provide some evidences for this. Lastly, we must examine the third premise, that is, the angel of the Lord was worshipped. Now, Sam Shimon in his article, The Lord Jesus Christ, the Glorious Messenger of God, references Numbers, Numbers 22, verses 31 to 32, which reads, Then the Lord opened the Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. So we see that the angel of the Lord is being worshipped. 
Not exactly. This is the primary example that most Christians would assert to show clear and explicit evidence that Malach Yahweh received worship. The problem is, the verse here does not state that Malach Yahweh was worshipped. Balaam simply bowed down for one of two reasons, either respect for the angel of the Lord or out of respect for whom the angel of the Lord was representing through Shalia or the law of agency. This can be easily demonstrated in the following verses. Genesis chapter 23 verse 7, Then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. Genesis chapter 23 verse 12, Again, Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. Genesis chapter 27 verse 29, Many nations serve you and bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Uh, Genesis chapter 42 verses 6 to 7. Now Joseph was the governor of the land. So the pe person who sold, uh, to all, who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. But Joseph doesn't argue with them. In Genesis 42, he doesn't argue with them. Uh, in Genesis 27, no argument. Genesis chapter Abraham doesn't argue and claim that he's worshipping the people. He's bowing out of them out of respect. Uh, if this is the case that bowing means worship, then were all the examples of persons in mass worshipping each other? Does Anthony read these verses with understanding that they worship each other? Clearly, Anthony's argument is archaic, inconsequential, irrational, and intellectually, intellectually abusive. Given the evidence as presented, he has very few options but to concede that he's committed eisegesis. No, he's playing with semantics. In other words, for him to prove me wrong, he'd have to demonstrate that Shalia cannot be applied to Yahweh, even though Exodus chapter 23, verse 22, and Zechariah 1 indicate this, that Malak Sorry, that Malach Yahweh cannot become Yahweh without, the use, without using the reductive fallacy as William D. Barrick expounds upon in his exegetical fallacies. That if the above two promises are wrong, that is, they can be negated, how is it then that if the angel is Yahweh, the, yeah, that Yahweh never calls the angel God? We have the angel creating a hierarchy by addressing Yahweh as Lord in Zechariah 1, but never Yahweh addressing the angel as Lord. If his argument is to be logical, we must see where through the law of equivalency, where Yahweh addresses the angel as Lord. So I hope Anthony understands my arguments. The first mistake you made was reading word for word from your series of articles. Those arguments are mostly based on semantics. You're not playing with semantics. You're being pedantic with the semantics. You spent at least 12 to 15 minutes playing with semantics. And you only quoted one verse from the scripture to prove your point. I don't see how you've proven your point using just one verse, especially if we look at the law of agency and the other verses and arguments I presented. Well, I, I've asked you at least 15 questions in my opening presentation, and I hope you can answer them all. Dixie, I rest my case. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Whoa, thank you, calling Christians. That is the end of opening statements. Next, we have cross-examination. We have calling Christians to begin engaging Anthony Rogers in his cross. Uh, the questions will be one minute each with a response time for two minutes. Is that correct, debaters? All right, we will begin with calling Kristen. We will ask the timer uh, to simply set a nine-minute time for each presentation. Nine minutes is good. Uh, questions, are you ready? All right, let's begin cross-examination. All right, can I get a one, please? Can I get a one, please? Okay, Anthony, my question is rather simple, okay? On what basis does Malak Yahweh become Yahweh? Why is there equivalence? What brings that equivalence? Is it, is it because the Malak speaks on behalf of Yahweh? Because he speaks in the first person? Or is it simply because you've uh, used the law of reductive fallacy on uh, Malak Yahweh to get Yahweh? Which is it? How do you get from Malak Yahweh to equate Yahweh? What is it? Is it based on semantics, which your major argument was based on? Or is it based on some verse where the uh, 
where the angel speaks in first person. What is it based on? I'd like to know. All right, so he has two minutes to, to respond. Actually, the person who's resting here upon semantics is actually calling Christians. You are relying upon people's assumption that the word angel simply means a created being, uh, a servant, and so forth. I went through great detail in my opening statement showing that the word does not have that restricted meaning. I quoted the sources. I quoted ancient Near Eastern scholars, biblical scholars. I, I went to great detail. I'm surprised that you're trying to press this point. It's a rather weak one and, and thoroughly discredited. Now, on what basis do I say that the Melach Yahweh is in fact Yahweh? Well, yes, because he declares that he is Yahweh. For example, in Genesis 28:13, he says, I am Yahweh, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. In Genesis 31, 13, he said, I am the God of Bethel. In 5, 11, he said, I am God Almighty. In fact, you gave this criteria in your article on your website where you try to reply to David Wood. You said, and I quote, that Jesus could not, uh, well, here's the quote, uh, or I'll just give you your argument rather than take all the time. You said that Jesus couldn't be God because we have no first person verbatim statement from Jesus saying, I am God. So according to you, a first person verbatim declaration, I am God, constitutes a claim to deity. We have just that in the case of the angel of the Lord. In Genesis 28, 13, 35, 11, and I would argue in Exodus chapter 3, and I'll give you more ev evidence in my uh, rebuttal. Okay, Anthony, you didn't answer my first question. I believe I have one minute to ask another. Just to respond to you really quickly here, that's actually incorrect. The uh, criteria I laid out was a first person verbatim statement. Now that's correct, but you've mistaken yourself, sir. The angel of the Lord isn't speaking on behalf of himself. Note I asked you that question. How do you distinguish between the angel of the Lord? This is again going back to my first question here. Uh, how do you distinguish between the angel of the Lord and Yahweh speaking? Because when we go to Zechariah chapter 1, we can see where the angel of the Lord speaks on behalf of the Lord. And it says that in the text. But can you demonstrate for us where and when the angel of the Lord does not speak on behalf of the Lord? Again, sir, that was my original question. Where can you see the angel of the Lord not speaking on behalf of the Lord? Just by himself. And how can you differentiate between the two? Because again, you're claiming that the law of agency or Shalia is non-existent. That Zechariah 1 chapter 1 is non-existent. Uh, Exodus chapter 23 verse 22 is non-existent. The question is yours. Please try to answer it this time. Uh, no, actually you packed more than one question into that, or at least the number of statements, a number of which were false. Uh, how do I distinguish when the angel is speaking on his own behalf and when he's speaking for the other person who is identified as Yahweh in the biblical text, the Hebrew text? Well, I do it the same way you just did it. In Zechariah 1, he speaks to Yahweh even as Yahweh speaks to him and calls him Yahweh, as I will show you in direct answer to your question or to your opening statement. Mike is free. Okay, again, you didn't answer my question. My question, again, for the last time. So I only have three questions, and you've abused them all. Again, sir, can you demonstrate for us what is the criteria? If the criteria is just where the text has to say that the angel of the Lord is speaking on behalf of the Lord, then according to the Old Testament, he only speaks three times on behalf of the Lord. All the other times, he just speaks on behalf of himself. Therefore, so using the uh, law of uh, agency, how can you equate through the law of non-contradiction that, that Malak Yahweh is equal to Yahweh? How do you arrive at that conclusion? Because you don't have a criteria to distinguish when Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh are distinguished from each other and distinct. You're claiming that when he speaks, he's just speaking on behalf of himself all the time. How do you arrive at that? Don't you know about the law of Sharia and why are you not applying it? That's a bit absurd, isn't it? Okay, I, I already explained this. You can pretend I haven't answered you, but now this is going to be the third time that I have. The same angel who calls himself Yahweh and who is called Yahweh by the biblical authors and by God himself in the biblical text distinguishes between himself and Yahweh by speaking of him in the third person, even as he himself speaks in the first person, even as Yahweh speaks about him in the third person and calls him Yahweh directly in Exodus 24.1, the very next chapter after the one you stressed in your opening statement. And so having answered you the third time, Hopefully I won't hear this again in the rebuttal period, the attempted rebuttal period. Mike Free. Okay, well thank you. That uh, wraps up the first round of cross-examination with calling Christians 
uh, examining Anthony Rogers. Now we will do the reverse. Anthony Rogers, make your cross-examination, please. Okay, since you say that the uh, messenger of Yahweh, the Melach Yahweh, is not God, even though he calls himself God and is called by others Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as in Exodus 3, for example, I wonder if you could tell us how such an idea could be communicated in human language if the sacred authors did want to express such an idea. In other words, if his first-person declarations and the biblical author's confirmation of that, and Yahweh's own declarations to that effect, are not themselves sufficient for you to determine that he is in fact a distinct divine person, on uh, what criteria do you have, what could possibly be given to you to, to be an indication that this is what's being claimed? In other words, if that language doesn't work for you, what language would? Mike Free. Well, essentially, you've asked the converse of my question. So let's correct you here for a moment. You made the statement that the angel of the Lord, when he speaks in first, verb, first person verbatim quotes, it's on his own behalf. So that makes no sense. The, the very term Malach Yahweh means a messenger of the Lord. So the messenger of the Lord speaks on behalf of who? The Lord. That's the very purpose of it. Remember, I asked you three questions. Can the son of a, son of a wife be equal to a wife? Can the daughter of a husband be equal to a husband? Can the secretary of a CEO be equal to a CEO? You're telling me yes, and so that makes no sense. Now, how can they represent this? Exactly in Zechariah chapter 1. It's explicit there, but it's implicit throughout the rest of the Old Testament. It's explicit in that one place for that very purpose, so that people like you wouldn't come and claim that Malak Yahweh equals Yahweh. Again, so you're, you're abusing the law of uh, reduction. You're using reductive fallacy too much here. Anyway, Mike's yours for your second question. Okay, you keep assuming that I haven't addressed your abuse of the term Melchak in the Old Testament. Now I'm going to ask you the question, since you assume it necessarily means someone other than God, now I'm going to put the question to you. How do you account for the fact that Malachi 3.1 refers to the Lord, Ha-Adon, as Melach, the messenger of the covenant, and Exodus 5.6, or excuse me, Ecclesiastes 5.6, where God is referred to as the messenger. Mike is free. But you see now, so now you're playing with semantics. You've jumped from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You're applying your religious beliefs to the Judaic text. When I go to Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, the tight, so you're not allowed to speak in text while I'm on the microphone. You should know that. You're breaking the rules of the debate. In any case, sir, uh, yes. <clears throat> anyway, in any case, in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, there's a title given to Yahweh, the messenger of the covenant. Why? Because he delivers the covenant, he delivers the agreements. When does the angel of the Lord actually become the source of the agreements? He doesn't, he just delivers them. So the messenger of the covenant is sent by Yahweh, that's essentially what it means. Because Yahweh delivers covenants with his people. That's it. Mike 3. Okay, thank you. You just admitted that the term messenger in Malachi 3.1 is in fact used for Yahweh, in which case all of your arguments so far that have been based or predicated upon that argument have just fallen to the ground. Uh, my question then, based upon that, is you said that he is referred to there as the messenger of the covenant because he is the guarantor of them. He's the one who issues them and makes them with his people Israel. How then do you account for the fact that Judges 2.1 tells us that the covenant is the covenant that the angel of the Lord made with Israel? Here's what it says. The messenger of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said to the people, I brought you up from Egypt and led you into the land I had solemnly promised to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, but you must not make an agreement with the people who live in this land. That's my question. How do you account for that verse in light of what you've just admitted? Mike's free. What I admitted is something I've always maintained. It's nothing new. Uh, secondly, uh, that's the purpose of the messenger of Yahweh, to deliver the messages of Yahweh. And the message in this case was news of a covenant. It would be kind of so absurd that Yahweh would have a Malak Yahweh and not use the Malak Yahweh, like he created him for no purpose. It makes no sense. Uh, again, see my uh, opening statement or my statement on redundancy. 
that makes your God redundant. He has Malak Yahweh and he sends Malak Yahweh to deliver his messages. Whether it be about good news, bad news, curses, punishments, whatever it is, that's the purpose of Malak Yahweh. He was created to be a messenger, the very word that defines it, Malak. That's a bit self-explanatory, no? All right, very, very interesting, very interesting. That was the last question of Anthony Rogers' cross-examination. Next, we will have the rebuttals. Is that correct? We will have the rebuttals next. We will begin with the affirmative position on behalf of Anthony Rogers, and we will respond with calling Christians in the negative. Each rebuttal will be 10 minutes. Each rebuttal will be 10 minutes. Let's begin with Anthony Rogers. Okay, thank you. Uh, I first want to point out that my opponent is simply incorrect when he states that I'm simply reading from my articles. But even if that were true, I would only be reading from them because I agree with them. A uh, little surprise. Uh, but now, if I was simply reading from my articles, and I'll be free to, I'll, I'll be happy to grant this for the sake of uh, the following point, then Colin Christians really should have done a better job responding to me. As it is, he's done uh, a, a very poor job. Uh, in his opening statement, for example, he uh, trots out, uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> Uh, he, he claims that there's simply a law of agency going on here, and that's what accounts for what we find in the case of the angel of the Lord. But notice that he himself admitted that the term for this in Hebrew is shaliah, not melach. Okay. Second, there's no example anywhere in the Bible where angels like Gabriel or Michael speak as God in the first person or are addressed as God or Yahweh, the very thing he claims is true of messengers. The angel of the Lord alone calls himself Yahweh and is addressed as Yahweh. For example, in the book of the prophet Daniel, a created angel is sent to the prophet and he is repeatedly addressed as Gabriel. The angel of the Lord, on the other hand, and the angel of the Lord alone is called God or Yahweh and says things like, I am God Almighty. The same thing goes for the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord was their constant refrain. Even if my opponent were able to show an exception to this in the case of angels or prophets, it would be just that, an exception to the rule. But with the angel of the Lord, it is the rule rather than the exception. Third, God promised the Exodus generation that no mere angel would go with them, saying that his very presence would go among them. We know from Exodus 23, referred to by my opponent, that it was the angel who possessed God's very name that accompanied them, the angel, the name-bearing angel who had the power to forgive sins. Uh, in, in Exodus 33, we're told that uh, the angel was, in fact, uh, God's very presence. That's the same thing we're told in Isaiah 63. We're told it was the angel of God's presence who accompanied them and saved them. This is not the language of mere agency, but of identity. He is not merely one who pretends to be the Lord, but is the Lord's very presence. Since my opponent likes analogies, uh, I have one for him. Uh, he uh, I agree with him that you can have an agent who is to be respected and received because of the person he represents. But the fact is that an agent is not entitled to everything that the sender is entitled to. For example, a husband can send a friend to deliver a message to his wife, but just because the sent one represents the husband doesn't mean he can sleep with the man's wife. Likewise, while an angelic creature could represent God and is to be respected, that wouldn't entitle him to call himself by the proper name of Yahweh, the name that belongs to him alone, according to the Old Testament and intertestamental Jewish sources. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able uh, to receive the worship that belongs to God alone. The idea that a mere representative, a shalia, or a representation of God can be worshipped in his place is called idolatry, and it's abominated by God through the prophets. So the very fact that the angel of the Lord who is called Yahweh is also worshipped as such proves that he is Yahweh indeed. Now, my opponent will say at this point, well, I proved that he wasn't, in fact, worship. No, what you did was you gave us your spin on one particular text of the Old Testament. I have two others for you to consider and ask you. In Exodus chapter 3, the angel tells Moses to remove your shoes for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. The same thing is repeated by the angel of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's host, the Sar Saba Yahweh, in Joshua chapter 5. Remove your sandals, the place on which you're standing is holy ground. Now, if my opponent wants to pretend that this is not worship, this is not an indication 
of worship, then he has to reckon with the Quran. Since he mentioned the New Testament, he mentioned Jesus, I can mention the Quran. In, in uh, Surah 20, verse 12, Allah tells Moses to remove his sandals because he is in his presence. So this is clearly an act of worship. Moreover, it was the angel of the Lord who dwelt in the pillar of fire and cloud. He was the Shekinah among them. We learn that from Exodus 14, 19. It was the angel of the Lord who came and spoke with Moses face to face in the tent of meeting, in the cloud, in the pillar. He's also the one who indwelt the temple, which means that all of the worship directed towards Yahweh at the temple was in fact directed to the angel of Yahweh. You simply can't uh, get away from this fact. Uh, moreover, he had nothing to say. I hope he'll say it in his... Uh, a rebuttal period about uh, Genesis chapter 16, the passage of full mention that I gave. He complained that I only gave one text. I only needed to. Uh, Genesis 16 very clearly has Hagar identifying the person who spoke to her as God. He uh, complains and says that she didn't recognize that she was speaking to, uh, through a telephone. Uh, at least that was your, uh, <laughs> your analogy. Uh, that will hardly do because the narrator confirms that Hagar was correct. He says she gave this name to Yahweh, who spoke to her? Genesis 16, verse 13. Now, you, you also said that in uh, Judges chapter 6, the angel speaks of the Lord. I already said in my opening presentation that any argument you bring forward that distinguishes the angel of the Lord from the Lord uh, will be irrelevant, since I grant, and that's part of my thesis, that's part of the debate, that the angel is distinct from Yahweh. How do I know when it's the, it's the angel of the Lord speaking? It's because it says so. Uh, otherwise, it's, he refers to the Lord. There are any number of indications, and you've already brought them up. I'm not sure why I'm being asked those questions. I agree with you uh, in those passages that he's being distinguished from the Lord. What you need to do is show how you can deal with the fact that the angel is called Yahweh when no other angel is called Yahweh. No other representative is called Yahweh. He alone among messengers is called Yahweh. He issues promises in the first person that only God can uh, make. Uh, he does perform divine works. You said uh, uh, we need some evidence of that. Uh, I, I, there's the one that I gave you in Genesis 16, that he would multiply Hagar's descendants. This is the same promise made by God in Genesis 21 and 22 regarding Abraham's descendants. Uh, you said uh, at one point, uh, just mentioned a few straw men here, uh, you said that uh, Christians uh, uh, turn a man into a god. That, of course, isn't true. You said we believe that Mary's a god. That, of course, isn't true. You said that we believe animals are God, a lamb, a dove, and so forth. These are simply metaphors. Uh, and you even had the audacity to say that Christians worship a, uh, the foreskin. Uh, that's entirely uh, untrue, sir, and it, it is an uh, undignified comment, and I'm so, uh, sorry that you had to stoop to that particular level at that point. Uh, how much time do I have left? Okay, uh, my opponent said that uh, the angel is not only referred to as Yahweh, and he tried to get, get around this by the principle of agency, but he also says the angel speaks to Yahweh. He suggests that this would be an example of multiple personality disorder. It would only be a case of per multiple personality disorder if, in fact, this was one person assuming that he was more than one person. But that's not my position. That's not the Christian position. I believe that God really is tripersonal, and, in fact, that the angel is a distinct person. So there's nothing to do here with multiple personality disorder. Uh, and everything to do with two actual persons who can speak and interact with one another. Two actual persons who are referred to as God. Now, I said that there's a, uh, there are many passages where you have to the angel as God. Allow me to give you uh, at least one of those before my time concludes. My opponent made reference to Exodus chapter 23. Here, God himself says that his very name is in the angel. This angel bears his very name in his own person. In Exodus 24, Yahweh tells Moses, in light of this fact, come up the mountain to Yahweh. Come up the mountain to Yahweh. Yahweh speaking tells Moses to come up to Yahweh. He's referring there to the angel of Yahweh. Now, my, another thing that my opponent said, he, he argued that uh, the, this first came from Justin Martyr, that Jews never believed this. That's entirely untrue. Uh, numerous Jewish scholars make quite clear that... Uh, Old Testament Jews did believe, in fact, in a second divine person. Uh, as Orthodox scholar, uh, Jewish scholar Daniel Boyerin, professor of Talmudic culture at the Department of Near Eastern Studies and Rhetoric at the University of California, Berkeley, tells us in his essay, The Gospel of the Memra, Jewish Binitarianism and the Prologue to John, uh, he tells us, quote, Although the official rabbinic theology suppressed all talk of the Memra, or Logos, by naming it the heresy of two powers in heaven, 
both before the rabbis and contemporaneously with them, there was a multitude of Jews in both Palestine and the Diaspora who held on to this version of monotheistic theology. That's pages 254 and 255. Dr. Alan Siegel, the professor of religion and Ingerbort Renner professor of Jewish studies at Barnard College before he died last February. In his groundbreaking book, Two Powers in Heaven, uh, published in 1997, he states, and I quote, Two Powers in Heaven was a very early category of heresy, earlier than Jesus, if Philo is a trustworthy witness, and one of the basic categories by which the later rabbis perceived the new phenomenon of Christianity. In fact, it wasn't just ancient Jews, pre-Christian Jews, who believed this sort of thing, but Jews at the time of the Talmud's production. Dr. Elliot Edwards, even medieval Jews believed this thing. Uh, Dr. Elliot Wolfson, the Abraham Lieberman professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at New York University, in his book, Through a Speculum that Shine, states, and I quote, it may be said that the Jewish mystics received the mythical dimension of a biblical motif regarding the appearance of God in the guise of the highest of angels called the angel of the Lord and angel of God or angel of the presence, which sometimes appeared in the form of a man. Evidence for the continuity of the exegetical tradition of an exalted angel that is in effect the manifestation of God is to be found in a wide variety of later sources. Uh, Mike is free. Okay, thank you very much. Anthony Rogers, now calling Christians. Please make your rebuttal. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Sister, can you have, a, like, you count down nine minutes, eight minutes, seven minutes, seven minutes for me, please, so I can go minute by minute and shut. Okay, just a Okay, so the first problem with Anthony's argument is that when the angel of the Lord speaks, the angel of the Lord is always speaking on his own behalf. And secondly, when the angel of the Lord receives a communication from another person, then the angel of the Lord himself is the recipient. Again, that is incorrect. As I have duly pointed out, the angel of the Lord is Malach Yahweh. What is the name of the angel of the Lord? Malach Yahweh. The purpose of the angel of the Lord or Malach Yahweh, as Anthony has conceded, is to be a messenger of Yahweh. And I asked him, can the messenger of Yahweh be equal to a messenger? And if that is the case, then why is God a messenger in this particular sense? Why does God create the title uh, Malach Yahweh only to become, sorry, to reduct or to red acts? the word Malak and just remain Yahweh. It makes no sense. It seems a bit redundant. So according to Judaic theology, especially according to uh, Rabbi Michael Skubak and other more popular Judaic scholars, we have the understanding that Malak Yahweh is simply another person identified as the messenger of Yahweh. In the New Testament, he's called the Spirit of the Lord. In Islam, it could also be identified as the Holy Spirit uh, or Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is a messenger sent by God to do God's bidding, just like a cell phone of some sorts. So you have examples where the angel of the Lord, or where the messenger of God, he speaks to people on behalf of God, but he uses first person verbatim statement. Does he do this? It is because no man can ever hear God and see God and live. That's understood. No man can see God, hear God and live. Likewise, when Yahweh sends the messenger of Yahweh. This is an interface for a person to speak with, with Yahweh through. They hear the angel of the Lord, but the words are from Yahweh. Just as you would use a cell phone and you hear the person on the other line, no genius is going to assume that the cell phone is the source of that person speaking. You're interfacing with another person. Likewise, when Moses comes to the burning bush, what is the first thing that he does? He covers his face because he knows that no man can see Yahweh and live. He concedes that. Moses concedes that he can't see Yahweh and live. So uh, how can it be rational for Moses to think that and then Moses to hear God and live? So Moses understands that he isn't speaking the figure in the fire isn't Yahweh, but the messenger of Yahweh, an interface for him to speak true to Yahweh. And he understands that by taking off his shoes and respecting the sanctity of the Lord, because this is a divine moment here. This isn't a random moment where the angel of the Lord has come to him of his own accord. The angel of the Lord only comes on behalf of the Lord. So Moses respects that particular moment. Likewise, in Zechariah chapter 1, we have the angel of the Lord interfacing with God himself. You have the angel of the Lord being commanded by God to tell someone something. 
and this is this this proves my point here right now. Unless, according to uh, Anthony Rogers' uh, logic and rational and doctrine, that the angel of the Lord is lower in hierarchy than Yahweh, Yahweh is lower than Yahweh. Again, that's a personality disorder. Yahweh being lower than Yahweh, it makes no sense. You have Yahweh commanding the angel of the Lord in Zechariah one to do something, and then you have the angel of the Lord dictating it. Uh, so is it that God commands one of his other personalities to do something that the other personality does it? Because that angel of the Lord seems to be lacking knowledge as well. He asked God when he will stop the punishment in Jerusalem. Why did the angel of the Lord not know that if he was the angel of he was Yahweh? You see, it's inconsistent and it's incoherent. It doesn't line up with one another. And again, you, your only point is that the angel of the Lord is the only angel called Yahweh. Well, that's a problem again. Are they calling the angel Yahweh or are they speaking through the angel to Yahweh? That's my argument, that they're speaking through the Shalya, who is the Malak, to Yahweh. And that makes sense, because no man can see God and hear God and live. Or for example, just to prove you wrong, in Psalms chapter 82 verse 6, the word Elohim, which means uh, uh, God of Gods, which you can see this singular God in your uh, uh, in your article as well, and you also um, can see that it means the word judges and it means the word angels. Is that a trinity in itself? Just because in Psalms chapter 82 verse 6 the word Elohim, Elohim calls Elohim Elohim. Elohim says you are gods. Does that make those people gods? Because according to your logic, when Yahweh calls, sorry, when people call the angel of the Lord, Lord, it means that the angel of the Lord is God. Likewise, when your God, if your God in Psalms 82 6 calls other people by Elohim, does that make them Elohim in a divine sense? If no, then your logic and your doctrine is it's incoherent, it doesn't line up with one another, you're not following through or you're not being sequitur with your argumentation. And what are some of the other arguments you used? You used that, um, oh, you, you, you said that uh, it, this would be multiple personality disorder if this was one person. So to correct you, uh, Yahweh is one being and according to you, he is tripersonal. And you said that uh, Yahweh and the angel of the Lord are two distinct persons. So one being that has more than one person suffers from multiple personality disorder. You should know that one person so one being with more than one person is called multiple personality disorder and you said that your God, your one God is tri-personal. Your God has multiple personal. I'm not trying to be insulting but that's what we categorize it as. Uh, secondly, you say say that the Jews believed that uh, in the Gospel of Memory or that the Logos was a divine being. I would actually concede that yes, there were many heretical views held by the Jews. But you see, as Christians, you took on some of the heretical views of some of the misguided Jews, and you have to agree to that. Early Christianity wasn't a monolithic faith, it was a, a hodgepodge faith with many groups. And Paul came across that. Paul on his journey to Jerusalem in Acts 15, he met various people with different beliefs. It was not monolithic, and you ha I don't have a problem with that. I would accept that some Jews believe that, but I would not call that to be a mainstream view. Just as you, are being a Calvinist, would not accept the views of the Catholics or, or the Jehovah's Witnesses. So there's no problem with me accepting that. Uh, the angel of the Lord is addressed as Yahweh. I addressed that point. Uh, okay, uh, for example, you say here that uh, uh, Hagar, when speaking to the angel of the Lord, calls the angel of the Lord Yahweh. Does she call the angel of the Lord Yahweh or the one who's speaking to her? Because the one who's speaking to her is Yahweh. Yahweh is speaking through the angel of the Lord to her. You'd have to demonstrate, sir, where and when the angel of the Lord is a divine and distinct person from Yahweh. You haven't done that. What you're demonstrating for me is that Malach Yahweh equals Yahweh. And then you scratch off the word Malach and you have Yahweh equals Yahweh. That's called the reductive fallacy. And I don't think that that's smart or intelligent. That's actually plain with your scripture. You have to give us something extant. You have to give us something explicit where Malak Yahweh stops being Malak Yahweh and is only Yahweh. And I don't see that from you. What I see you doing is using the reductive fallacy and reducing God to an angel. Just like the Jehovah's Witnesses did. A lesser God. And just to point out something to you. I have two questions I hope you can answer, okay? Uh, these two questions are, does the angel of the Lord do everything that the Lord does? 
does the angel of the Lord do everything that the Lord does? So for example, does the angel of the Lord create a human? Does he kill a human? Does he take the spirit of a human? Does he reveal scripture to anyone? Does, does he do everything that a God can do? Is he all powerful or is he subservient to another being? We know he's subservient because of Zechariah 1 and Exodus chapter 23. So you have to demonstrate how this angel of the Lord fulfills everything that Yahweh is. For example, when uh, Yahweh is asked, Who are you? He says, eh, yeah, Asher, eh, yeah, I will be who I will be. He does not say, I am the angel of the Lord. You know, he doesn't say that. You have to show where the equivalent, I'm, I've asked you, show the equivalent relation. Give me a base case or two and demonstrate the equivalent relation. Simple. I'm not trying to manipulate your scripture because I haven't. I've used only scripture to interpret scripture unlike yourself where you've had to go to, I mean you've only quoted one verse from the Bible and then you quoted four others. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, Genesis chapter 32, Genesis chapter 16, Exodus 24, Exodus 49, Joshua 5, maybe 5 or 6. But you haven't quoted anywhere where the equivalent is noted and that's really disappointing. And the thing is, I you mentioned that I didn't, sorry, I was rude for mentioning the holy purpose and it's very low. So this is your history. Your people were so savage, not well, not you, but the early Christendom was so savage, was so primitive, so barbaric. They were grasping for straws and they needed to worship anything and everything. And that was the purpose of my opening statement. You like to worship angels, man, woman, animals, and the foreskin of a person. That's not my faith, that's your faith. That's a fact about your early faith. I mean, if you could worship the if you could worship the blood and flesh of a human, part of his flesh is the holy, and that's not my belief. That's your belief. So if you find that disturbing, then why are you worshiping a man? That makes no sense to me, sir. You've insulted your own belief, not mine. All right. So I believe I can summon the mic now. Salamu alaikum rahmatullah. Okay, now we have just completed the opening statements, cross-examination, and the rebuttals. Uh, we have cross-examination beginning next. Uh, do the debaters want a two-minute uh, break or continue? Okay, let's go ahead. It, it will be better for the timer as well. Uh, for to take three minutes and then that will get us on an even time it will be a lot easier so let's take a three minute uh, recess a three minute uh, intermission and we will begin in three minutes I will come back to the mic thank you to both of the debaters and welcome to the room everyone Okay, for those who are just coming in, we are having a debate today. Uh, the debaters are calling Christians versus Anthony Rogers. The debate topic is, does the Old Testament teach the angel of the Lord is a distinct divine person in the Godhead? This is the topic of tonight's debate. We have so far had opening statements, cross-examinations, and rebuttals. We'll, we will resume in approximately two minutes to cross-examination. We will begin again in two minutes with cross-examination. So we'd like to wrap up the owners and the members of Answering Christianity. We would like to welcome all of the guests to the room. And uh, we will resume in approximately one minute. Uh, will the debaters raise your hand when you're ready to proceed?
Are we having a question and answer? I don't think we discussed that. Uh, yes, afterwards, of course, we will open the floor up for questions and answers um, after the debate. We will open the floor up, of course. And what we're waiting on the debaters to raise your hand when you're ready. Three minutes is up. If you're there, uh, we'll wait for you. We can't proceed without you guys. So uh, let us know when you're ready by raising your hand. Not you, drop the hand. We're talking about the debaters. We're still debate having the debate. We only took a three minute uh, recess. Uh, this uh, debate has been quite extensive, quite thorough. And uh, they have been uh, talking and debating for over an hour now, approximately an hour and 20 minutes. So it's nice to have a recess. What we're doing right now, and uh, we will resume momentarily. All right, the parties are here. The debaters are back. Uh, we have Colin Christians here and Anthony Rogers here. And they are debating the topic, does the Old Testament teach that the angel of the Lord is a distinct divine person in the Godhead? And now we are beginning with the second cross-examination and we will begin again with the negative uh, position um, and that will be calling Christians uh, this time we will have two questions and uh, each question can be presented in one minute with a two-minute response and then we will follow up with the affirmative position with Anthony Rogers all right, it's your mic uh, for examination, calling Christians. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Can I get a one, please, inshallah? Can I get a one from Anthony and Waduha, please? Uh, Anthony, can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, Waduha, you can start the timer now if that's okay. Let me know when it reaches 30 seconds. Uh, the evidential fallacy. And the, uh, the evidential fallacy is the concept of a prima facie, literally, at first view. Uh, evidence is very important. Prima facie evidence is evidence that is sufficient to raise a presumption of fact or to establish the fact in question, unless evidence of equal veracity is presented in rebuttal. So, what Anthony is appealing to is the evidential fallacy. Specifically, he's also using the law of uh, the fallacy of reduction and the fallacy of superior knowledge. He's trying to equate the angel of the Lord Malach Yahweh with Yahweh and that's a problem because there is no basis that Malach Yahweh and Yahweh are the same person except for his sole argument that Malach Yahweh uses first person. But the purpose of Malach Yahweh is to speak on behalf of the Lord. He is a messenger. So can Anthony tell me, Anthony, if the purpose of Malach Yahweh is to speak on behalf of Yahweh, then how can you equate the speaking of Yahweh with Yahweh? The person who is speaking on behalf of Yahweh, it takes the form of the three questions I asked before, and I affirm again that you haven't answered my question. Using those fallacies I've noted, can you refute that point for me? Using those three fallacies, how can you equate the messenger with the message, with the source of the message? That is my question. Mike's free for you. And I apologize if I've been hasty with my words. Sorry about that. Mike's free. Okay, the, the question is, how can I equate the messenger of Yahweh with Yahweh, that is the one who brings the message with Yahweh from whom he comes? Well, because the biblical text calls him Yahweh. It's similar to Genesis 19.24, for example, where it says, The Lord rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord, that is Yahweh from Yahweh. There you have two persons being referred to as Yahweh. The angel speaks as God for God because, in fact, he is God. That's what the biblical text says. Mike is free. And that's not a reduction, uh, reductionistic fallacy, by the way, since you yourself admitted that God himself can be called a messenger, a malach. 
Mike Spree. Okay, just to correct you, I said that God could be the messenger of the covenant because he delivers covenants with his people. There's a difference. Again, you've reduced that. You've reduced it from messenger of the covenant to messenger. Uh, you're playing games with me here. You, it's either Malak, Yahweh, you take out Malak, and then we go to the um, uh, we go to the messenger of the covenant, and you take out of the covenant. You're playing games and semantics here with me, and you're being pedantic with the word uh, Malak and Yahweh. It's very odd. Uh, again, a follow up to my previous question. How do you, you see? You're not answering my question. I don't think that you're listening, or you may not be answer. You may not be understanding me properly. If I said I am Anthony. And I speak on behalf of you. How can you differentiate from me being Anthony and me speaking on behalf of myself? How do you differentiate? Use me instead, because when you use Yahweh, you're not getting me. So maybe if I change the analogy, I, I speak on behalf of you. And how do you know when I speak on behalf of you and I speak on behalf of myself if I always speak in the first person and you're the same person at all points in time? Mike's yours. Hope you answered my question this time. Okay, well, the the way I differentiate between me and you is because you yourself said I'm simply speaking on your behalf, and you made it clear that you are not me. There's that's not what's going on in the case of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord not only speaks for Yahweh, he speaks as Yahweh. He not only speaks about Yahweh, he's called Yahweh. He not only is called Yahweh by others, he calls himself Yahweh, uh, and he performs the works of Yahweh. He's given the attributes of Yahweh, and he receives the worship of Yahweh. If you want to pretend that you're me and speak in the first person to my wife, uh, does that entitle you to have relations with my wife, or would that, in fact, be idolatry and punishable by death? Mike's free. Okay, that was two questions from calling Christians. Now we have Anthony Rogers with his cross-examination of calling Christians. Begin your cross-examination now, Anthony Rogers. Okay, uh, now here's an analogy. Uh, you, you used your own analogies. Allow me to use one. Uh, since Muhammad, in your thinking, is a messenger of God, and since, as you say, a messenger, according to the so-called law of agency, can call himself and be called by the name of God, and receive the worship that is due to Yahweh or God and so forth. Uh, can you as a Muslim call Muhammad Allah? Uh, that's my question to you. Mike's free. Well, the problem with that would be that we're interfacing between two different religions with two different concepts of God. The Judaic uh, religion and Islam have two completely different Aqidah and doctrine completely. So you can't equate the two. That's a false analogy or a straw man, really. You can't have the two. They're two completely different uh, religions. But the thing is, I can actually fix that for you. Uh, in the Quran, when Allah says, uh, let's say, for example, uh, give me a... Okay. The Quran says in Surah Al-Ikhlas, Kulhu wallahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the one. Who is supposed to say those words? The messenger, Muhammad. So he says things about God, just like the Malak Yahweh says things about God. And in the Quran, it's the Kalamullah, it's the word of God, the first person verbatim word of God. Likewise, when Malak Yahweh speaks, he speaks in the first person of God's words. So yes, maybe on that level we can draw a similarity. But to say that, can a person call Muhammad Allah? Well, you know what? He can't call Muhammad Allah, but uh, he can con converse with Muhammad. He can ask of Muhammad things about Allah. So, for example, when uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in his masjid in Medina, and I believe it was a group of Jews that came to him and questioned him on the identity of Allah, Allah inspired him and he began to recite the words of God. He began to recite verbatim the words of God, the first person, Wahi, the Kalamullah of Allah. So on that level, I can say yes, but otherwise I have to say no, because it's two different doctrines. So I hope that answers your question, and I believe my... Okay, I have one minute, all right. Uh, and to specify here for a moment, uh, in the Quran, let's say, uh, uh, Surah 2, Ayatul um, Kursi, uh, Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyul qayyum. 
Now these are the words of Allah, but they've been recited to the Messenger. No one is going to say that Muhammad calls himself here Allah who is ever living and everlasting. But this is what Allah says about God. Similarly, when the angel of the Lord speaks, he speaks the words of God, the first person verbatim words of God. But he does not claim to be the source of those words. He is the means through which those words are delivered. Can you explain to me in what way your Yahweh is a Malak? How does the word Malak come into that play? If you're going to ask me how does a messenger in Islam equate a messenger in Judaism, I'll have to throw the question back at you. How can Ma how can Yahweh become a Malak? What is the personhood and attributes of the Yahweh who is Malak? Is it created? Is it equitable to other created beings? I don't know. You'd have to answer that for me. All right, Mike, through your question. Okay, since I provided examples of where the angel says what is tantamount to, I am God, worship me, can you give us an explicit example of the angel saying, I am merely a representative, put the shoes back on your feet, don't worship me, worship God? Mike Free. Okay, well that's quen that question is rather simple to answer. The thing is, he's the messenger of Yahweh, so he only speaks what Yahweh commands him to speak. He doesn't speak of his own accord otherwise unless dictated by Yahweh. He only fulfills the commands of Yahweh. This angel, Malak Yahweh, does not act outside of the powers that Yahweh has given him. So you see in Zechariah 1 that the reason that the angel is questioning God is because he's asking a question on behalf of someone else. So this angel can't make a statement, I'm not God, don't worship me, because that's not the purpose of the angel. The angel is not an individual character. The angel is a person there for a purpose to either receive conversation from a person and relate to God, or receive something from God and relate it to a person in a way they can understand. That's the purpose of Malach Yahweh. Now, if Malach Yahweh was independent and this wasn't his job, then he wouldn't be Malach Yahweh. He would just be an angel and since there's no word for angel in the Old Testament uh, when we look at Malak the purpose of the Malak is just to relay messages his purpose isn't to go about making monologues about himself you know like you would find in Shakespeare and Macbeth and all his and Romeo and Juliet that is not his purpose his purpose is just to deliver and receive messages back and forth he isn't there to give a long speech about himself and who he is what he likes to eat you know these things are inconsequential to him. That's not his purpose. So I hope that answers your question. All right, that was the end of the second set of cross-examination. Next, we have the rebuttals. And this is the second set of rebuttals and these rebuttals will be followed by closing statements. However, the rebuttals will be five minutes each, beginning with Anthony Rogers. Begin your rebuttal. It's your mic. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my opponent said, asked the question, does the angel refer to the one who spoke to her as God, that is to Hagar in Genesis uh, 16? He argues instead that it was God who spoke, the angel was merely an interface. So he asks the question, does the angel refer to the one who spoke to her, or does, does Hagar uh, refer to the one who spoke to her as God? Was the angel, uh, in fact, the one she identified as God? And the answer is yes. Three times in the text, as I pointed out, it says that the angel of the Lord is the one who spoke to her, and yet according to verse 13, we're told that she gave this name to Yahweh, who spoke to her. Again, we've had uh, all sorts of comments and claims made about the law of agency, and yet that doesn't cover the dynamics of what's going on here in the case of the angel of the Lord. It's not simply that the angel speaks in the first person, which my opponent seems to keep forgetting. It's that the person who speaks in the first person is, in fact, identified as God by the person to whom he is speaking and by the author of the narrative, the author of the event. When I asked my opponent, where does the angel say, I am just an angel, I, I am not God, don't worship me, he couldn't give us an answer. Instead, he tells us that he's called the angel of the Lord. My question was, where does the angel ever indicate that as the angel of the Lord, he is anything other than simply God? In fact, there's no statement in the, in the text of the Old Testament where the angel announces himself as such to anyone. He simply appears, 
He declares his deity, he claims divine prerogatives, and he receives their worship. In fact, in Judges 6, we see that uh, Gideon worships the angel of the Lord by offering a sacrifice to him. In Judges 13, we see the same thing in the case of Manoah. I brought up the example of Exodus chapter 3 and Joshua chapter 5, where the angel commands them to remove their shoes in his presence. In fact, my opponent even went on later to quote the angel of the Lord uh, in Exodus chapter 3, and without realizing he was quoting the angel of the Lord. He says that when God identifies himself, he calls himself Yahweh, I am that I am. Those were spoken by the angel of Yahweh. Now, my uh, opponent has also argued, at least at one point, uh, that they, they knew that they weren't talking to God because, of course, God can't be seen. God, of course, is in God, is not a man. Uh, so it's not possible for God to be seen. Now, properly understood, I completely agree with him. However, it's a non sequitur, a logical fallacy, to infer from this that God cannot tempor temporarily appear in the form of a man and be seen as such. Consider an analogy. Created angels are not men either. Neither can they be seen in their true nature since they are spirit according to the Old Testament. And yet when they do appear, and appear they do, they consistently appear in the form of men. For example, in Daniel 9.21, the prophet Daniel refers to the angel Gabriel who appeared to him as the man Gabriel. Later in uh, Daniel 10.4, he says the same thing, and that's found many other times throughout the Old Testament. And this is exactly what we see in the case of God in the Old Testament. Whereas Exodus 33.20, for example, features God telling Moses that he cannot see him in all his glory and live, just ten verses prior, nine verses prior, he tells us that God spoke to Moses face to face. The idea here is that God in his fullness can't be comprehended or seen by any man, but he can condescend and reveal himself in some palpable way as these passages clearly demonstrate. Uh, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're told that uh, no, the people did not see God uh, when he spoke to them from the mountain. But yet in Exodus 24, 9, we're told that Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel did see they were allowed to go up the mountain, the people were not. Here's what the text says. Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet uh, there were, appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. So very clearly, my opponent has appealed to things that are not true contextually. Uh, he has assumed that the word Malach indicates that he's simply a creature, and I demonstrated very in a very detailed way in my opening statement that that is not true. That's not true according to scholars. That's not true according to its usage in the Old Testament. It's used for God. It's used for angels. It's used for men. Uh, I, I demonstrated that quite clearly. When he appeals again to Malachi 3, he claims I'm switching terms. Even though, you know God is called the angel of the covenant there, the messenger of the covenant. He claims I'm playing games. Uh, but in fact, I pointed out that the uh, angel of the Lord is himself the one who claims to be the one who established the covenant with Israel in Judges chapter 2, uh, verse 1. Moreover, it was the angel that God promised that he would send with them, who's called the very angel of his presence in uh, Isaiah chapter 63. That's not a mere agent. That is someone who is, in fact, identified as Yahweh himself. In fact, in Exodus 23, 20, he's said to bear the divine name. In Exodus 24, he calls him Yahweh. Come up the mountain to Yahweh. And then it says they worshipped him there. Uh, Mike is free. All right, thank you very much, Anthony Rogers, calling Christians. Are you ready for your rebuttal? There you are. All right, it's five minutes for you. Okay, Anthony, I loved your uh, rebuttal. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so you said um, she, uh, Hagar gave this name to Yahweh. I actually agree with you. Hagar gave this word, gave, you said, I'm quoting your verbatim, she gave this name to Yahweh. I agree with that. She didn't give it to Malak Yahweh. She gave it to Yahweh. So that's a very good point. Um, you said that she gave this name to the person who spoke to her. That is very good. It was the Lord who was speaking to her through the interface, which was Malak Yahweh. Of course, his purpose is to deliver the words of God. Uh, you said, where does the angel of the Lord indicate where he is not God? Well, you see, the thing is, then again, I refer to you my previous point. That's not the purpose of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord does not speak of his own accord unless directed by Yahweh or unless 
he's interfacing with a human. So for example, the angel of the Lord comes and he's speaking to Yahweh. He's speaking the words of the Lord to Yahweh, um, to Hagar. And when Hagar speaks to him, these words are referenced to God. And then God speaks back through Malak Yahweh. That's the purpose of him. He doesn't stand there and, you know, he tells God, okay, God, hold up. I got this, you can chill Yahweh, I'm Malak Yahweh, you can chill, let me tell Hagar what I think, maybe her dress isn't too pretty or something. He doesn't do that in the Old Testament, nowhere does he do that. All that he does is that he conveys what God commands him to say. And there's only a couple, a few situations where he actually speaks or refers back to the Lord, and that is because he is interfacing what people say back to the God. As in Zechariah chapter 1, I believe verses 11 to 15. Uh, you mentioned here, Judges chapter 6, uh, the person worships Malachi Yahweh. I actually covered this in my opening uh, statement. I don't believe you were listening. But in Judges chapter 6 verses 13 and onwards, he isn't, he isn't worshipping Malachi Yahweh. He bows down. And I did give examples where people bowing down does not mean that they are worshipping that person. Genesis chapter 42 verses 6 to 7. Genesis chapter 27, 29. Genesis 32, 12. Genesis 23, 7. These are situations prophets and entire nations are bowing down to other people but they're not worshipping them and you have to remember that if you're equating bowing with worshipping then you're equating those verses which I just referenced as worship and that would be idolatry then your Abraham would be an idolater I don't believe that you know and you would have a uh, Jacob and Isaac being idolaters. I don't believe that. That's your claim. You've just claimed that these people are idolaters from your own religion, based on your own criteria. Those are unfounded claims, and those are plain with the scripture. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, I already covered this. You see, you're repeating yourself now. You claim that Moses removes his shoes because he's speaking to the Lord. I agree with that. He removes his shoes because of the sanctity of who's addressing him, and who's addressing him is the Lord, and the Lord is addressing him through the angel and that's confirmed in Acts chapter 7 in the New Testament where that is done uh, I believe the first martyr of Christianity admits that the person in the fire is the angel of the Lord and he switches between the word God and angel of the Lord demonstrating that they're not the same being they're two completely different beings um, you mentioned that uh, they had uh, Yahweh calls uh, Malak Yahweh the angel of his presence I will accept that as well because the angel is like his presence the angel isn't that's the purpose of the Shalia you're agreeing with the criteria for a Shalia this person Malak Yahweh is a Shalia he's acting on behalf of God he does things that he he carries out the punishments of God the rewards of God on behalf of God he's a Shalia that is his purpose you're not arguing against you're arguing for me and I congratulate you on that you said that uh, Yahweh tells Moses and Aaron to come up to the mountain to meet Yahweh again I will agree with that because they are in a sense going to meet a form of Yahweh not in a literal sense but in the messenger sense for example let's say Anthony oh, sister Badu, how much time do I have left two minutes is that correct Sister Waduha? Sister Waduha? Right, that's good enough. So here's a simple analogy, right? So Anthony, uh, Anthony orders, um, Anthony, Anthony receives an audio telegram. You know, an audio telegram. Person knocks on his door, the person opens the door, and the person sends to Anthony, you have been invited to a party. Now, Anthony, if you get an audio telegram such as that, do you think that the person bringing the telegram is the, is the host of the party or a person hired by the host of the party for which you are interfacing with? And that's the analogy I'm working with here. That's my understanding. You're claiming that the one delivering the message is the source of the message. But that is not the case, and I don't believe that. And that's clear because you just confirmed that Malak Yahweh is a Shalia. And I have to agree with that. You're not fighting against me, you're fighting with me. And I think that's really wonderful. That's a good change in argument. I'm proud of you. Uh, okay, so the mic's free. Thank you very much. All right, absolutely fantastic debate. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, we, Before we begin the closing statements, we certainly want to thank the debaters uh, who have been here close to two hours debating. It requires a lot of endurance, and we certainly appreciate your time and your preparation for these 
uh, conversations, these debates. Um, next, we will have closing statements. Each side, the negative and the affirmative, have 10 minutes. And we can begin right now with the negative position being presented by calling Christians. Are you ready, calling Christians, to present your closing statement? If you are, give me a one. All right. Please proceed with your closing statement. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, uh, in my opening statement, I referenced that Anthony would depend on three premises, and th those premises were that the angel of the Lord would claim divinity for himself, the angel of the Lord would do acts that God did, and the angel of the Lord was worshipped. I spent 15 of my 20 opening minutes addressing those claims. Now, Anthony spent 15 of his 20 minutes uh, playing semantics with the word malak, and it, whether it's an, an indefinite noun or noun, how it applies. Now, I'm fine with what he did there. That's inconsequential to the debate. But what I have a problem with is that he's playing semantics when it comes to the identity of the angel of the Lord. My first premise was that the angel of the Lord claimed divinity for himself. And it is true if you read it at first a fallacy argument, the evidential fallacy. And okay, that's a fallacy by itself. That's a known exegetical fallacy. You literally read things. You have literalism, and that's an eisegesis. You don't accept that when you're doing an intellectual uh, examination of a scripture. You never look at things literally on first value, on face value. That's inadequate and that's poor reading, that's poor scholarship, that's lazy reading. That's not meant to be an insult against Anthony, but it's meant to highlight some of the problems that he's used, some of the mistakes that he's made in his eisegesis. And to point out again, my argument is quite simple. Anthony cannot distinguish between the angel of the Lord and Yahweh because he considers them to be the same person. He never makes them distinct from each other. He argues and he's consistently argued that Malak Yahweh equals Yahweh. And then he crosses out the word Malak. So he has Yahweh equal Yahweh. Now that's a problem because Malak Yahweh has a specific purpose and he's given the translation for that term. He spent 15 minutes translating it. I have to thank him for that. He's on my job for me. Malak Yahweh means the messenger of Yahweh. So he's saying the messenger of Yahweh equals Yahweh. Now why does he say that? He's saying that because the messenger of Yahweh makes statements in Yahweh's name. That's circular reasoning. That's circular logic. That's the very purpose of Malak Yahweh, to convey the messages of Yahweh. So he cannot distinguish between Malak Yahweh and Yahweh because he thinks that they are the same person. His argumentation works against him. So they are not the same person. They are two completely different beings altogether. You are making them into one being and one person by saying Malak Yahweh equals Yahweh. For example, when the Malak Yahweh says something, uh, let's say he speaks on behalf of the Lord. It doesn't make him the source of those statements. He is a messenger. That is his purpose. And you've defined the word. You said it in your uh, definition on your website that the original meaning of the word is one who is sent or a messenger. And I'm working with that definition. You are not. You had to spend 15 minutes, and this demonstrates how weak your argument was. You had to spend 15 minutes playing with this term to equate Malak Yahweh with Yahweh. Yeah, and you've completely run away, you've completely uh, you know, fled from the point that Malak is a messenger. This person is a messenger and you have to remember that they are a messenger and that's the sticking point between you and I. If I agreed that he was Yahweh, this debate would be over. And if you agreed that he was a messenger, you will be contradicting yourself. Now, I ask you, using, is your God redundant? He creates Malak Yahweh. Or Malak Yahweh is created because you said angels are created and he's called the angel of the Lord. You said that in your last rebuttal. If the angel of the Lord is, or the angels are created and the angel of the Lord is an angel, because that's pretty much self-explanatory, then how can the angel of the Lord, who is an angel, not be created if the angel of the Lord, who is an angel, and all angels are created?
See, that's a circuitous argument. It follows true. But then you're saying the angel of the Lord, who is an angel, and angels are created, is not created. That's non sequitur. It's just falling apart as you go along. It makes no sense. It doesn't follow through. And again, you can never demonstrate for me where the Malak Yahweh speaks as himself and not speak as Yahweh. And the only situation he does that is when he's interfacing between persons. And you know that from Zechariah chapter 1. You can never distinguish between Malak Yahweh and Yahweh uh, as two completely different beings because you're making Yahweh into Malak Yahweh. And using the law of equivalent law of non-contradiction, that just doesn't work out. That's a fallacious argument. It's a mendacious argument. It's an illogical, irrational, inconsistent argument. Again, I've asked you five questions, and all my five questions were actually one question. You keep equating Malak Yahweh with Yahweh. And why do you do that? You do that because Malak Yahweh speaks on behalf of Yahweh. But that's the point of him. That's the reason he exists. He exists to speak on behalf of Yahweh. He exists to convey messages. He exists to convey the doings of God. That is his purpose. I would like for you to consider just for a moment that Malak Yahweh is not Yahweh. And I hope Anthony can do that. You know, let's try to be honest here. Malak Yahweh is not Yahweh. What is this, What are some of the functions of Malak Yahweh? Well, he has to serve God, he has to obey God. We see that in Zechariah chapter 1 and by the very definition of his name, the angel of the Lord that provides a hierarchy. Secondly, uh, he has to convey God's messages. Thirdly, he has to do God's bidding. So for example, he might curse somebody, he might fight someone, he might wrestle someone, but this isn't God, this is the angel of Yahweh. So then what is the function of, that is the function of Yah the angel of Yahweh without being Yahweh? But what is the function of the angel of Yahweh when being Yahweh? Is there any distinction? There is none. So you're equating two persons and you've yet to indicate that they're two different persons. As I said, you've taken Malak Yahweh and you've made it equal to Yahweh and then you've crossed off Yahweh and Malak. Let me write that out. Malak Yahweh equals Yahweh and then you cross off Malak and you get this. Now you did mention for a moment that um, you can partially see God if he takes a form. I, I think I should have something that uh, Rabbi Michael Skobak uh, messaged me uh, during a previous discussion I had with him. He says, uh, it is impossible to see God. See Shemot, chapter 33, verse 20. Uh, God is not a man. Bamid Bar, chapter 23, verse 19. Uh, God is not physical. Devarim, chapter 4, verse 12 and 15. He continues to say that idolatry is always defined as the worship of any God that was not made known to the Judaic ancestors when God revealed himself, that's Devarim chapter 4 verse 35, to them at Mount Sinai. Uh, that's Devarim chapter 13 verses 3, 7 and 14, etc. The Jewish people never heard from their ancestors that they were to understand that God has a body or that they were to conceive of him as a physical in any way. That is why when Moses comes when Moses comes to the fire he covers his face but the very fact that Hagar could see and speak to the angel of the Lord provides a distinction that if Moses assumed that, that Yahweh was in the fire why did he cover his eyes if he was expecting that he couldn't see God and why does Hagar never cover her eyes your argument isn't consistent given those two specific instances. Hagar doesn't cover her eyes because she knows that she's not speaking to God. And Moses covers his eyes because he's not see he's seen a flame and he doesn't know what's going to come out of it because God has warned him. No man can see God and live. So you see the distinction. It's a completely two different beings with two different purposes. When Jacob wrestles with the angel, why doesn't he cover his eyes? Because he's not wrestling God, he's wrestling an angel. And he defeats the angel. That's the very purpose of his name, the one who struggled with God and won. So it has to be a completely different person opposed to Yahweh. Otherwise you're conceding that Yahweh lost to Jacob, that a man was able to see God in some form or the other, which contradicts the verses I just gave from Rabbi Michael Skobak. So your points are very inconsistent. And if we are to work with uh, uh, Yahweh calls the angel of the Lord, let's say, you know, where does Yahweh call the angel of the Lord a divine person? That's never in the Old Testament. And I can 
just throw this out there in Psalm chapter 82 verse 6 is something you did not reply to you had Elohim who is Yahweh calling man Yahweh when you worship sorry calling man Elohim would you worship the Elohim that Elohim called Elohim because that's a criteria for worshiping uh, the angel of the Lord you claim that Hegel called the angel of the Lord uh, God and therefore he was worshipped also by Balaam likewise in Psalms 82 6 your God calls another person Elohim a group of person Elohim will you worship those people and if not then your argument is contradictory inconsistent and incoherent it makes no sense your argument does not line up given those facts and if there's anything I have said that is incorrect I apologize and if I'm speaking with haste I apologize uh, so I hope my argumentation has been clear and I will upload my uh, statements to my website free for anyone to read all my citations are there and well, you can read Anthony's two and three year old articles on his um, answering Islam's website thank you for coming out and uh, I look forward to doing this again and the question and answer thank you Anthony it was a very cordial debate and I hope the room was up to your standards it was wonderful having you here and uh, may God bless you all Salamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Okay, she's a clock here. Keep calling Christians. Now we have Anthony Rogers with his closing statement in the affirmative supporting his position. And it will also be for 10 minutes. It is your mic and your 10 minutes closing statement. Anthony Rogers. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Ijaz Ahmed, for a rousing discussion. Uh, I specified in my opening statement that my thesis in this debate is twofold. Number one, the angel is a distinct person from someone else called Yahweh, and the angel is identified as a divine person simultaneously. That is, he is also identified as Yahweh. I also specify that any argument that my opponent makes to the effect that the angel is distinguished from Yahweh will be irrelevant since that's entailed in my thesis. So all of the arguments that have been premised upon that uh, are simply irrelevant to what I've been arguing tonight. The only arguments that have been those which try and attempt to account for the angel being identified as Yahweh, which I don't believe that my opponent has adequately done. For example, in the uh, primary passage that I appeal to in the beginning of this debate, Genesis 16, my opponent interprets the passage as saying that it was the angel who appeared to Hagar, but it was Yahweh who spoke to her. Okay? He makes the same claim when it comes to Exodus chapter 3. It was the angel who appeared in the bush, not Yahweh, and it was Yahweh who spoke to her, that is, through the interface of the angel. In fact, he's wrong on both scores. Not only does Genesis 16:13 say that Hagar called him God that spoke to her, but it also says that she's speaking of the one who she saw. That is, here's what the verse says in 16.13. Hagar named Yahweh who spoke to her, right? You are the God who sees me, for she said, here I have seen the one who sees me. So not only does Hagar identify as God, the one who spoke to her, but the one that she saw. The same thing is true in the case of uh, the angel of the Lord in Exodus chapter 3. Again, remember, my opponent argued that it was the angel who appeared, but it was God whose words were spoken. It was God who spoke and was heard. But Exodus chapter 3 verse 4 and verse 16 both tell us that it was God who appeared in the fire. It was God who was within the bush. So Exodus 2 tells us it was the angel. Exodus 3 verse 4 and 16 tell us it was God himself. And so my opponent's uh, attempt to distinguish between the angel as the one who appeared and God as the one who spoke fall flat to the ground on both of the uh, primary passages that have been discussed in this debate. Now, uh, my opponent once again repeated this idea that God could not be seen, and he quotes uh, a rabbi that he was in correspondence with, but I already responded to this. I pointed out that the same God who says that his glory cannot be fully seen uh, in Exodus chapter 33 verse 20 is the same God who did appear in human form to Moses just 10 verses prior. Exodus 33:11 says, Thus Yahweh used to speak to Moses face to face. It's after that that Moses says, Show me your glory, but God says, You can't see my glory and live. So very clearly, God can assume a human form, and that's no argument against my thesis. 
In fact, I also pointed out that Moses, along with Aaron and his sons and 70 of the elders of Israel, went up the mountain and saw God. That's stated in Exodus chapter 24, verse 9. Now, my opponent also ignored, incredibly ignored, my uh, exposition of the, or the, the definition of the meaning of the term melach, and pretends that this means ipso facto, that the angel cannot be God. And yet you heard him admit that the term angel can be used for God. In fact, that's what's said in all of the uh, lexical sources. The term is used for God in, in, Exod or in Ecclesiastes 5.6 and Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, the claim that uh, you know I'm, I'm ignoring the, the rest of the phrase uh, falls flat in light of Judges chapter 2.1. For it's the angel of the Lord who, in fact, establishes the covenant. He is the one who led them out of Egypt. He said that uh, he can agree, for example, with Isaiah chapter 63, where the angel is referred to as the angel of his presence. He said, I can agree because the angel is like his presence. But that's not what the passage says. It says that he is, in fact, the angel of his presence. And if we go back to Exodus chapter 33, the very passage he must have read, because he's brought it up several times now, it's in that very passage that God tells Moses, I'm not going up to, with you. I'm going Going to send simply an angel but God says we will not go up we don't want to or Moses says we don't want to go up unless your own presence goes with us and then God promises opens oh, will go with you and that's in light of X, Isaiah 63 a uh, very clear indication that God Yahweh who said he would go with Moses his very presence not a mere angel uh, but whereas Isaiah 63 says it was in fact the angel of his presence we have a very clear equation of the angel with Yahweh the angel is called the angel of his presence in Exodus 33. It said that God's very presence would be what would be going with them. Uh, my opponent, I don't think, had any adequate answer for the fact that pre-Christian Jews, in fact, believe that the angel of the Lord was a distinct divine person within the Godhead. I quoted a number of scholars. I quoted uh, Dr. Margaret Barker of the Society for Old Testament Study. Uh, I quoted uh, uh, Daniel Boyerin, Alan Siegel, who are top-notch Jewish scholars in their field. Uh, now, one of the things that my opponent has to reckon with then is that this indicates that there were pre-Christian Jews prior to the time of Christianity who believed these things. This was not a Christian innovation. This was a thoroughly grounded and rooted tradition within ancient Jewish circles. In fact, it was even held by the medieval theologian Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Nachmanides, not Nachmanides, Nachmanides. And this is uh, clear from all of the sources. It's pointed out as well by Dr. Elliot Wolfson. It's pointed out by Dr. Moshe Adel. It's pointed out by Dr. Abrams. Uh, all uh, uh, contemporary Jewish scholarship admits that this was the position of ancient pre and was in fact suppressed by the Talmudic rabbis. That's why, for example, you don't find anybody arguing until the time of the Talmudic rabbis that the angel of the Lord is simply to be accounted for in terms of a principle of agency. This was not an ancient Jewish belief, and for good reason, because the angel received the worship that belongs to God alone. My opponent had no adequate answer for that. In fact, he misrepresented my answer when it came to Judges chapter 6 and Judges 13. I did not refer to the fact that the word worship is used there. I refer to the fact that in Judges 6 and 13, sacrifices are offered to the angel of the Lord. The fact that sacrifices are offered to him, which are only to be given to God in our acts of worship, is a clear, undeniable, unequivocal indication that the angel of the Lord received what no mere messenger, no mere agent can possibly receive. It's stated in the commandments that a person is not to worship anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or under the earth. Yahweh alone is to be worshipped. But the angel was worshipped. It goes back to my analogy where I said if I send out a messenger on my behalf, he may indeed speak in my name, but he is not entitled to everything that I'm entitled to. He doesn't get the prerogatives of having relations with my wife or any number of other things that are exclusive to me. The fact that the angel is in fact worshipped, sacrifices are offered to him. Uh, Moses is required to plant his face in the ground as is Joshua before the angel of Yahweh and to remove their shoes. All of this as acts of worship which are to be rendered to God alone indicate that the angel is not merely an agent. Uh, moreover, my, my uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, I hit something here. Uh, moreover, my opponent, uh, oh, my opponent on a number of occasions 
accused me of identifying the angel as the same as Yahweh. And yet, that's not my thesis. My thesis is that the angel is a distinct person from Yahweh, who nevertheless is, in fact, a divine person within the Godhead. He is, in fact, Yahweh in his own right. That's why he receives the worship that's to be given to God alone. My opponent, I don't think, had any adequate answer to the fact that uh, if the principle of agency is true, we should expect to see this in the case of angels and prophets. We should expect to see them be called Yahweh and, be called, uh, and to call themselves Yahweh. We see no such example. My opponent didn't give one. In fact, he talked around that point. But the angel very clearly calls himself Yahweh, says, I am God Almighty, receives worship. In fact, Jacob, the one that he appealed to in Genesis chapter 48, prays to the angel of Yahweh and invokes his blessing upon his children. The fact that Jacob prayed to him, once again, is an act of worship that is not to be rendered to any mere creature. So if my opponent's thesis was true, that the angel was merely a representative for God, why, pray tell, is the angel being prayed to? Why is he being worshipped in the way that Exodus 3 and Joshua 5 show, and which is not given to anyone else, not even uh, what the examples he gave in the case of Abraham bowing to others, uh, that sort of thing to anyone except for the angel of Yahweh. No one sacrifices to Abraham. Abraham sacrifices to no one else. The angel of Yahweh alone receives this kind of worship and utterly uh, explodes the thesis that the angel is a mere representative. Now, consider an analogy, folks. If somebody uh, found my opening statement and looked at it and thought, hey, uh, this guy is simply arguing that the angel is merely a representative for God. Would you think that that person was correct? Now, why do you, would you assume that, then, in the case of the Old Testament, which speaks in the same way that I have? The Old Testament calls him Yahweh. I call him Yahweh. But nobody thinks to say of my uh, thesis that I only believe he's a mere agent. In fact, I don't, and neither does the Old Testament, and that much is clear from the angel of the Lord who indeed receives worship and is to be worshipped, and I call, therefore, everyone to his worship. And with that said, I, uh, I conclude. Mike is free. All right, absolutely fantastic debate. Fantastic. I hope everyone enjoyed the debate. I uh, I have to repeat, absolutely fantastic. I can uh, tell there were uh, there was a lot of hard work and uh, put into this debate on behalf of the debaters, uh, and we thank you greatly for sharing with us. And uh, we would like to open up questions for the debaters on the topic. We may move into some other topics afterwards but right now we want to focus on the debate walaikum salam to uh, aki muslim night welcome to the room at least chiming in in text and what we would like to do give you five minutes okay anthony rogers and perhaps calling christians i don't know if you want to take five minutes too uh before we begin the question and answering we do have so many people in the room. We have uh, 125 people in the room. So please, we're going to have to follow the rules. Uh, we don't want any insults to the members, no insults to the guests, and certainly none to God, our God, their God, the only God, the prophets, or the messengers. Uh, because, like I said, we do have a room, a full room, 126 people. So, uh, remain orderly, and I will uh, monitor the question and answers. So, we're going to do one by one for the debaters. Uh, I see Aki Gomer Oz Dubar is there. I thought I saw Royalson's hand up after Gomer Oz but uh, I, I see we have Derek Adams. He's representing, uh, I guess, an so-called objective, uh, so-called outsider's position. So I don't know who his question is for. Um, but I do know Kiko Moros Dubar is your question. Who's your question for? Well, you tell us who your question is for, and uh, we're going to start with whoever your question is for, uh, Mr. Anthony Rogers. All right, uh, Mr. Rogers, are you back? It seems like I saw you were back. Anthony, are you back? Are you back, uh, Anthony Rogers? 
I don't know if my computer is freezing or what. Please do not, not be hot. Uh, my computer is freezing up, I think. Alright. Alright, there you go. Okay, I keep going, Rose, to bar. Then we're going to follow up. I think we have a... a he's, he's back, Anthony Rogers. Back. Okay, super. First question is for I keep Anthony Rogers. I think the next question uh, is from Royalson for our brother Colin Christian. Derek, you, you you're gonna we're gonna have to see who your question is for. All right, and uh, we'll we'll take it from there. After those two questions, uh, I will take the mic back. Please be polite in your presentations and stay on topic of the debate. Thank you very much, and welcome to the room. It's your mic, Aki Gomorrah, to boss. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All the Muslims, greetings to all the Christians in the room as well. Um, I just want to congratulate both speakers on a fantastic discussion and invigorating debate. Uh, do we have a clear voice? Do we have a clear voice? Uh, I'd like to direct my question to Mr. Rogers, who uh, g gave a fantastic presentation. However, I did notice, Mr. Rogers, um, I don't know if it was an intentional deception or what have you, but during the uh, uh, references in Genesis 16 referring to Hagar, uh, you kept uh, you, you kept redundantly saying that responding uh, with an interface known as the Angel of Yahweh. Uh, sir, this would be impossible since Yahweh by name was not revealed until the time of Moses. We have no uh, evidence that... Uh, Yahagar, in fact, knew that she was speaking to an angel of Yahweh. That this time God was being called Elohim. So my question for you, sir, besides uh, this apparent deception of referring constantly to this event that it was the angel of Yahweh when the term Yahweh was virtually unknown at such a given time until generations and generations later, my question for you is why the angels of God all use it theophorically in their names none of them are given theophoric names of Yahweh rather all of them as well all of them are given theophorically uh, functions and titles which are related to the generic term Elohim in other words why from a biblical standpoint of the Old Testament and this is also something which includes human beings human beings are seeing Theophorically carrying the name of Yahweh himself. We have Isaiah, we have Jeremiah, on and on. We have human beings representing the name of Yahweh. But the angels themselves, why not a single angel referred theophorically with the given name Yahweh? Rather, all of them used the generic term Elohim, such as Mikael, Gibrael, etc., etc. Mike is free. Okay, that's actually a fantastic question to be asked to my opponent. Why is it that the angel of Yahweh is, in fact, identified by this divine title when no other angel is? You're simply mistaken when you say that the name Yahweh was not used in the time of Hagar and that it doesn't appear there in the verse. The term Lord that's used in English translation uh, is repeatedly uh, the term Yahweh. It says in verse 13, So Hagar named the Lord, that is Yahweh in Hebrew, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me. For she said, Have I even seen the one who sees me? Uh, that is why the well was called the Erla Hai Roi, which means the well of the living one. And so uh, the question that really needs to be addressed is why is it that this angel is identified by the divine name, but no other angel is, especially in light of my opponent's claim that an angel... Uh, can be addressed as Yahweh and can speak as Yahweh without distinguishing between himself and Yahweh, which he admits that the angel does all the way throughout the Old Testament with the only, the lone, the sole exception that he gives us being Zechariah chapter 1. Why is it throughout the entire Old Testament period this angel is called Yahweh? In fact, he's even called Yahweh in, uh, in Zechariah chapter 3 uh, verses 1 and following. And so why is it that this angel alone is called by this divine name? Mike Spree. 
Okay, well, to respond to that, it's quite simple. That's the purpose of this Malak Yahweh. You're acting as if there are hundreds of Malak Yahweh, but as you conceded and more or less admitted, there is no other angel called Malak Yahweh. There is only one Malak Yahweh, and that's his purpose. That's why he is there. That's why he specified with this name. If there was more than one Malak, Malak Yahweh, then you would find, uh, then you wouldn't have that instance in Genesis 16. And you have to understand that. If we go to Genesis 16 verse 7, right? It says, Malak Yahweh. It says that quite clearly. Uh, yeah, I'm using the scripture for all transliteration here. And it's telling me that's what it uses. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain. And Malak Yahweh found her by a fountain. So this angel of the Lord had a very specific purpose. This specific purpose was to relay messages. And I've always maintained that. Now if you're telling me that Malak Yahweh is Yahweh, what is the purpose of calling himself Malak? What is the purpose of inventing a new title for him? Was this a God that was so vain that he needed a new title, a new identity to meet people? Or was this angel an actual angel created for a particular purpose which is it? It's either or. And what I'm getting from you is that that isn't the case. The second, the latter isn't the case. It has to be the former. That Yahweh was vain. He decided, okay, you know what, guys? I want to call myself angel of myself. And I'll go and I'll tell people, uh, I'll deliver messages, even though I have angels that did that to other people. You had Gabriel, you had Michael, you had various angels giving vain messages on his behalf. But this particular angel is always in the most important parts of the Judaic doctrine and the Christian doctrine in the Old Testament. He plays a very pivotal role, and that's his purpose. It's like God's personal secretary. God commands this angel to do what he has to do, and this angel does it. That's the purpose of this angel. And I think that you keep making the mistake that just because this angel speaks in first person that those words apply to the angel that's inconsequential that's incoherent and inconsistent because then it defeats the purpose of the word malak and i don't know why you keep deleting that word what is with that word that you can't wrap your head around that word seems to mean nothing to you and that's not only insulting to me it's insulting to jews as well and i find it very abhorrent personally but anyway we have nakdaman coming up next uh, you know the messianic jew so it's interesting to hear what he's going to have to say. So anyway, the mic's free. And just so you know, Derek Adams is not objective. He lives on the answering, he lives on the answering Muslims uh, uh, blog. I mean, you can find him there. He's not objective. Derek, just come out as a Christian already. Don't play games with us. It's a bit weird. It's very weird. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I actually didn't think the topic was going to be that interesting, but it actually turned out to be one of the most interesting uh, debates we've had. So now we had a question from uh, one Muslim. Now we're going to go to our uh, first Christian question. Royalson, are you there? Give me a one in text. Uh, your question for calling Christians. Oh, I think you're red dotted. Uh, we will remove the red dots as you approach the mic. The, the goodness gracious uh, please refrain from PMing me Your, my computer is freezing please refrain at the moment while I'm on the mic at least Assalamualaikum and welcome to the room everyone you're Mike Royal son Okay, all right. I don't know if Roy Olson can hear. We've got a question coming up for Calling Christian. We have a question coming up from Calling Christian. No, we didn't hear you. We didn't hear you. Try, one, try again, and then we'll have to get you on the next round if we can't get you now. 
Go ahead and try again. Well, that one failed because you didn't pick up the mic. You're not picking up the mic. All right. Well, we will go ahead to our next. Okay. Okay. We'll we'll keep you in line. All right. Now I know Radical Moderate can is anxious to get to his question, but we do have a question from Derek Adams, who says he's not a, a Christian, so he gets in. Uh, on the basis of being, uh, I don't know what he's supposed to be, but anyway, welcome to the room, Derek. Uh, thank you for putting before the debate. And go ahead and ask your question. It's your mic. Okay, wait a minute. Now, where is Derek? What's going on? Where is he? Raise your hand, Derek. Derek, raise your hand. Okay, I see what the problem is now, a technicality. Where are you, Derek? Okay, you're not going like to like Muslim Night. It's your mic. Okay, Radical Moderate, it's all depending on you. What's your question for calling Christian? All right, can you hear me? Can I get a mic check? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, first, uh, um, first of all, um, Maduha, can you please undot the room, maybe, um, since Muslims seem to be um, typing away. Uh, but my question is for calling Christians. You, you, well, you, you made the observation that, for instance, in the debate, uh, that Moses is called an Elohim. Okay? I'm wondering, can you point out where anyone or anything is called Yahweh except for God so that's my question to you is anyone called Yahweh by God's name not an Elohim but Yahweh by the God by God's memorial name your mic sir all right radical can I get a one please inshallah assalamu alaikum can I get a one please yeah, Radical, can I get a one from you? Okay, right, thank you very much, Radical. Well, the answer is quite simple. The word Yahweh doesn't exist in the Old Testament. You'll get Y-H-W-H, but you're not going to get Yahweh. And I hope that answers your question. Now, I know what you're trying to get at here, because in the um, from the verses that uh, Anthony quoted and the verses I quoted, you have people seemingly calling the angel of the Lord Yahweh which I again emphasize so again I emphasize that they were not addressing the angel of the Lord but they were addressing the one to whom was speaking through the angel of the Lord for example when Moses was speaking to the angel of the Lord he didn't he didn't all right let me get the verses let me just get the verses here for you I was just reading and watching it all right and judges Judges 6 verses 20 to 23 you see sorry verse 23 verse 22 sorry you have Gideon here and Gideon says when Gideon realized I want you to note the distinction that Gideon makes here he doesn't make an equivalence he makes a distinction 
he says when he realized that it was the angel of the Lord he exclaimed alas sovereign Lord I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face and then the Lord said to him peace do not be afraid you are not going to die so there's a distinction there and I hope everyone in the room can see the distinction between the angel of the Lord and Yahweh because the angel of the Lord admits you can see the angel of the Lord face to face and not die because this person is not Yahweh that is my that that is my understanding from those verses so again my answer is in Genesis um, Judges chapter 6 verse 20 to 23 where we have Gideon exclaiming alas sovereign Lord so he's speaking in the first person, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He's addressing two completely different beings. He's speaking to the Lord and he's telling the Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord. And then the Lord replies to him, You're not going to die because you've seen the angel of the Lord. That clearly distinguishes one person from the other. And, uh, okay, so I think, I, I, Anthony, would you like to answer on that? Or... Do we go to the next question? Or? Okay, you'd like to answer? Okay, no problem. All right, Mike's free. Well, of course I want to answer that. Uh, okay, he, you're, you're ignoring the fact that, as I pointed out in Genesis 16, that it wasn't simply the one who spoke to her, who's identified as Lord and God, but the one that she saw, who is explicitly identified in the text as the angel of the Lord, four times, in fact. Likewise, in Exodus chapter 3, the one who appeared within the bush is identified as God in verses 4 and 16. When you appeal to Judges uh, 13, I think uh, we're referring to Judges 6, uh, where he, you say, uh, distinguishes between the angel and Yahweh. But notice that in that chapter, the reason he's fearful because he saw the angel of the Lord is because he thought he would die because of the belief that one can't see Yahweh and live. I already explained this in light of Exodus chapter 33. Nobody can see Yahweh in his glory and live. That was not the general fear of seeing angels. Nobody feared that upon seeing an angel, a mere angel, that they would die. This was only a belief held uh, in terms of seeing Yahweh. But in Exodus 33, we're told that God did appear and did speak with Moses face to face, even though he didn't do so in all of his consuming glory, which would have definitely struck Moses dead. So while I grant that there is a distinction in Judges 13 and 6 and so forth between the angel and Yahweh, it's not because the angel isn't Yahweh, but because in fact he is. Again, in that very passage, he, is, uh, he receives a sacrifice at the hands uh, of uh, Gideon as well as at the hands of Manoah in Judges 13. So very clearly in the same text, we have two persons identified as Yahweh and who receive the worship that belongs to Yahweh. It's not simply the one who's speaking, uh, who's identified as Yahweh, but the one who appears, the one whose appearance strikes fear in the heart and uh, spells certain death in the eyes of uh, Old Covenant Jews. Uh, now, you, uh, you said uh, before that uh, uh, they seemingly call the angel of the Lord Yahweh. They do not seemingly call him Yahweh. That's the express statement of all of the passages that I brought up. They explicitly call him Yahweh. The name, in fact, does appear there. So Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her, you are God who sees me, I have seen the one who sees me. The one that she calls Lord, the one she says saw her, is the one that she, uh, in fact, says she herself saw. Mike's free. Okay, thank you very much. What I have done, I have undotted uh, a royal son you can text. Um, because I do not want to unread that the whole room right now. You are free to text. We do have some Muslims that are texting, so we do want to allow some uh, Christians to be able to text. Uh, Derek, uh, let's see, who's, who's next? Uh, who's next? The next question is for Anthony Rogers. Please stay on topic, uh, of, on the topic of the debate. Okay, we have, um, we have next the next question, Sister Alhanua. Are you there? Do you have a question for uh, Mr. Anthony Rogers? Okay, you're gonna be, be you're gonna have to wait until it's calling Christian's uh, turn for a question. It's nice. This time it's uh, Anthony Rogers. Uh, do you have a question, uh, Sister Alhanua, on this topic? 
Okay, I think her hand up is up for support. Let's see. Oh, she's dotted. Yeah, she's dotted. Let's see. You're on red dotted, sister. Are you have a question? Give me a one if you do. I'm going to release the mic to you. Okay. It's your mic. Yes, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I do have a question for Anthony. Yes. He mentioned that there is a distinction <coughs> between Yahuwah, the angel of uh, the angel of Yahuwah, and Yahuwah. So, <coughs> since there is a divine Yahuwah, the angel of Yahuwah, he is divine, and uh, Yahuwah. So that he, there is a belief you believe in two Yahuwahs. So therefore, there are two Yahuwahs, two gods, right? And there's a second question for you. Oh, my birds, I'm sorry. Uh, there's two. <clears throat> the second question is, when God um, <clears throat> spoke to Moses, and he, Moses saw him face to face, did he strike him to death? Uh, strike him dead? Because no one can see him, correct? And then what about Aaron who, and the other people who came up on the mountain and saw God? What happened to them? Could they see them? And is there any description of how they uh, described God when they saw him? Uh, and what happened to them and the mountain when they saw God? Please explain. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, your question was for the birds. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, okay, you, you said that uh, my belief that the angel of the Lord is in fact also Yahweh implies that there are two gods, two Yahweh. That in fact is not my position. I'm arguing that there are two persons who are identified as Yahweh. I do not assume, as Unitarians assume, as Muslims assume, that God is unipersonal. I believe that God is unique. There's nothing like him in uh, anything uh, in, in all the world, in, in creation, and so forth. God is unique. He's unlike anything and everything. Uh, it's only in the God of Christianity, in fact, that you find a God unique in, in this way. Uh, so my belief is not that there are two different uh, gods, but that there are two persons who are, in fact, uh, identified as Yahweh. Two persons who are called Yahweh, two persons who are called Yahweh, uh, who call themselves Yahweh, two persons who share the name, nature, attributes, and perform the works of Yahweh. Uh, you asked a second question, you kind of cut out. I think you asked uh, why the people were not struck dead. I explained this. Uh, the very passage in Exodus 33:20, 20, uh, where, Moses, uh, where God tells Moses he can't see him in his glory and live, uh, explains that. God appeared to Moses in a uh, veiled form. God appeared to Moses in a, uh, if you will, a, a, a form of condescension. He appeared in the form of a man and spoke to Moses face to face. That's what the text says. Exodus 33:11. Moses spoke with God face to face. Then Moses asked God, let me see your glory. God says, you can't see my glory and live. That explains why when people saw the angel of the Lord, knowing that he was in fact Yahweh, they were afraid that they were going to die. But in fact, he was not appearing to them in all of his glory. That's why Hagar marvels at the fact that she had seen God. She had seen the one who had spoken to her. This is clearly the belief of the Old Testament. It's explicitly stated again in Exodus 24.9. The people saw God. In fact, saw something under his feet. Right? So it refers to God appearing to them in human form. Uh, and that much is clear. Uh, Mike is free. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Okay, let me just... Uh respond to those questions inshallah um, okay so Derek he refers to Exodus uh, chapter 19 I believe where Moses goes up to the mountain if I'm not mistaken so he's up on the mountain but he doesn't actually see God it says here and I quote uh, alright they stood at the base of the mountain Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord came down upon it in fire its smoke went up like the smoke of a stove and the whole mountain shook now Moses spoke to God but it never says he actually sees God do you know that oh yeah Mr. Rogers not um I confuse you guys right Mr. Rogers not Mr. Adams <laughs> right so he doesn't actually see God and uh, one of the problems with Anthony's argument is that he refers to Exodus 33, Shemot chapter 33. And it says that Moses, he comes outside of his tent and he speaks to a pillar. 
He doesn't speak to, he speaks to a pillar of cloud, not to a physical face, a human face. He speaks to a pillar of cloud. So again, they don't see God. They don't see a human. They don't see a person face to face. He sees fire. They see clouds, but they never actually see a physical divine being. No, not a veiled being. All they hear is a voice and they see something that can reference to them, like where to go to speak to this God. So, they go, for example, the Jews would go to the temple, so they can always speak to God. It's called God's house for a reason. You look at Moses, he goes to Mount Sinai and he speaks to God, but God isn't physically there. He speaks to God. God is all hearing and all knowing. God is not like a man that he needs to come down and sit down next to you to hear what you have to say. Right? right they, that's exactly what I'm saying, Anthony, and that's verse actually agrees with me. They don't literally see God. This is all figurative speech. It's, an, it's what we call an allegory. It's called an allegory. It's a, it's a literary device. And it's called an allegory. Because let's, for example, go to where the verses I quoted. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 12 and 15, it explicitly states that God is not physical. And you're free to quote that if you want. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 12 and 15 and the thing is when we go to Exodus chapter 33 verse 20 it's explicit and it's clear you cannot see God that is your problem you're telling me Exodus 33 is uh, it's conditional that you could see God or you could maybe see God but not in a direct form it's a sort of maybe no that's just ambiguity that's be that's incorrect that's just being shallow you're playing games with your God it's either Exodus 33 20 is explicit and clear that you cannot see God and live or God has lied like now let me just get the verse here in Numbers chapter 19, it says God is not a human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. So did God change his mind in Exodus 33, 20? Yeah, I think we should go back and forth because just to be quite honest, these people are just going to ask questions to us. We're going to reply to them and then we're going to go back at each other. <laughs> right so i don't think this is really a good question and answer so uh, what do you want to do anthony do you do you want to um do a back and forth instead because you know that's what we're going to end up doing what what do you, what do you want let me know but uh, i'll finish up in okay we'll ask um royal son to get his question next and then we'll continue but let me just clarify one last point here numbers 23 19 god does not change his mind right that's clear that's explicit so let's stop right there consider exodus 33 20 in the context of numbers 24 we develop the understanding that god has to be consistent in his tier in his in his uh, commands to us in his commandments to us he has to be clear and consistent he says that he doesn't change his mind exodus 33 20 is clear that no man can see god and live but Anthony is presupposing that Exodus 33 20 is pretty much uh, false. He's telling me that God did change his mind. He he says he can veil himself, but he can't veil himself. That he can take a physical form, but he can't. Deuteronomy chapter 4. So, Derek, you need to make, I'm sorry, Anthony, I'm going to keep mixing up the both of you. You need to make up your mind. It's either one or the other. Did your God change his mind or not? You have to be consistent, and you're not being consistent. So, I hope that answers the sister's question. They never physically see God but they see something representing them for them to go and speak to God through. Again, another interface, a cloud, fire, these are interfaces, just an indication. Go to this place, speak to God, and you will hear God responding to you. That's all that it is. Unless Anthony would like to worship a cloud, or he'd like to, or he'd like to worship fire. I don't know. Would you, Anthony? Can I get a one? Do you want to worship fire? Or do you want to worship a pillar of cloud? Because if the angel of the Lord is a if you want to worship an angel, you already worship humans, animals, let's throw in a cloud and let's throw in fire there one time. Let's go to pantheism all the way. Don't hold back now. Let's not wait any longer. All right, Mike, free for sister. Okay, I know that uh, Anthony Rogers would like to respond to that. I certainly would like to respond to that. I keep calling Christians. But what I would like to do is go ahead. The uh, royals and has to leave. Uh, he's going to try his question again. I hope that uh, Anthony Rogers can um, 
uh, respond to remember what he has to say. Uh, go ahead, Royalson. Okay, here's Royalson's questions. Can you please explain the difference between an agent and a partner, if any exist? Essentially, are you telling us that a law has agents but not partners? I almost want to answer that. Please support your answer by giving examples from the Old Testament, New Testament, the Quran, or Hadith who spoke speaking first person as God, being identified as God, worshiping, claiming divine prerogative. Thank you. All right, I hope you got that. At least it's uh, intact. Pretty long, uh, a multifaceted uh, question. Uh, actually, two or three questions. Are Are you there, calling Christians? I keep calling Christians. Are you there? Okay, respond uh, whatever you whatever you can. You're quite welcome, Royals, and, and welcome everyone uh, to the room. We're about to open up the session uh, after. Uh, um, Anthony Rogers uh, responds. We will open up the room. It's your mic. I keep calling Christian. Okay, Salamu alaikum. Can I get a one, please? Can I get a one? Okay, uh, Royal Son, can I get a one from you? I know you were getting some trouble earlier. Okay, very good, Royal Son. So, your question is can you explain the difference between an agent and a partner? Okay, well, you see. When we see an agent, it's the person representative. So, for example, in Islam, you have the Rasul who brings the Risala. And the Risala is a Wahi. So I hope you've understood that. The Wahi is revelation and the Risala is the message. And the Rasul is the messenger. So the messenger delivers the message that is and the message is a revelation from God. So that's one example of what I would say an agent or a representative. Uh, for example, Khalifa. He's a representative of God, but he isn't God. Now, you're asking what's the difference between an agent and a partner. A partner works on behalf of God, which is what we see in Zechariah chapter 1 with the angel of the Lord. He's called the Malak Yahweh, or the messenger of Yahweh. That's subordination right there. That's a hierarchy. That's someone lower. So he's doing work for Yahweh. That's why he's called the messenger of Yahweh. That's why you have the... That, that's why I made three analogies earlier that Anthony could not refute. I mentioned that, uh, would you consider the secretary of the CEO? The CEO, no you won't. The secretary will always be under the CEO. That's the same principle between an agent and God. Uh, secondly, a, a partner, a partner would have to be equated with the person, with, the, with, the, with God. So a partner of God would have to have the same attributes, position and power of God. Now you can't have an angel of Yahweh being a partner of Yahweh because then you have Malak Yahweh equals Yahweh but there's only one Yahweh and although you might, you might argue that Malak Yahweh equals Yahweh are actually two different persons that's incorrect because Malak Yahweh is an entirely different being it's subordinate because of angel of Yahweh you have that the very definition of that word implies that one is lower than the other. One works on behalf of the other. And that's what I believe. Um, essentially, you are telling me that Allah has agents. Yes, He has Rasuls. So He has Anbiya that convey His message to the people. So I've given examples of that. Now you want an example of a person who speaks as, as first person. Okay. Well, the angel in Zechariah 1, he speaks in first person. Uh, in the Quran, it's the Quran is literally God's word to the Muslim. The Quran is, uh, you can probably equate the actions of the angel of the Lord with Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the context that the angel of the Lord only speaks God's word. Similarly, Muhammad peace be upon him would speak Kalamullah or the God or Lord's word. That's what he would speak. So the Quran, if when I say the Quran, I say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That isn't the word of Muhammad. But that's the word of God. And he's just conveying those words to us. So that's a distinction we make. Now the thing is, you ask for me, where can you show that a person is 
been identified as God. I gave you the example, Psalms chapter 82 verse 6. You, that word Elohim by itself has three meanings. It means God, it mean, which Anthony agrees with on his website and his articles. Um, it means angel and it means judges. Your God identifies God as judges. So your God identifies judges as gods. So that's your problem to deal with, not mine. Thirdly, um, worship. The Malak Yahweh was never worshipped. Anthony has never proven that. He says, why would a Balaam bow down and worship uh, the angel of the Lord? Have you even read the verse in which this actually occurs? Let me read it here. It's Numbers chapter 22 verses 31 and 32. Something that Sam Shimon also quotes in his article, The Lord Jesus Christ, the Glorious Messenger of God. It says, Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the road, angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell. And the angel of the Lord says, I have come here to oppose you because your part is a reckless one before me. That's the purpose of the angel of the Lord. Clearly simple. That's the purpose of the angel of the Lord. He came with a sword. That's why he bows down. But Anthony won't accept that. I don't know why. He comes with a sword for fashion. He comes with a sword to, like a wand to do magic tricks. No, he came with a sword to fight him. That's the purpose of it. That's quite clear and extant. Uh, what was the other part of your question here? Uh, yeah, Malak Yahweh was never worshipped. Especially if we go to Judges, which Anthony appealed to, Judges number 6. Uh, he didn't, there's no way in verses 19 to 23 that this offering is made to the angel of the Lord. But the angel of the Lord is present when the offering is being made. That's the difference. Anthony would have to show me here where the, where the, uh, sacrifice or you know the bread and whatever the meat and unleavened bread was made specifically for the angel of the lord i don't see that what i see is that the angel of the lord is there the angel of the lord directs him what to do angel of the lord touches with his staff it goes up in flames and angel of the lord disappears and i quote again when gideon realized that it was the angel of the lord he exclaimed alas sovereign lord i have seen the angel of the lord face to face and the lord replied to him peace salam salamu alaikum do not be afraid you are not going to die it's clear. It's clear. I don't need to prove anything beyond that. And I don't think anyone needs for me to prove anything beyond that. Okay? Uh, I, what, didn't Radical have his hand up? I'm confused. Anyway, I'm going to pass the mic. I believe Anthony would like to respond to me. Uh, Anthony, are you there? Can you give me a one? Anthony? Okay. okay. Uh, Anthony, I have a question for you. Uh, are we going to continue this back? I'd like to schedule this for another day where we can have another maybe an hour session yeah i know but i mean a continuous back and forth do you want to do this at a uh, another day where we can have a same two hour period a dialogue of sorts on the same topic a continuous maybe a part two not necessarily a debate format but we talk and we ask each other questions would you agree to that can i get some confirmation or not anthony okay so okay but I'm, I'm going to pass the mic to you and uh, hopefully we can uh, work out a date with Sister Waduha. Oh, and by the way, you mentioned that you were uh, anxious about this room dotting you from speaking and from being biased. Can you come up and uh, probably explain your experience with us during this debate? Did we do those things that you claimed we might have done? I'm just curious. And uh, are you happy with what was provided and the circumstances that brought you here? Would you say that you're quite satisfied with the services that we offered you and how you felt in the Muslim room? Okay, I'd really like to hear that from you. So that's it from me, guys. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thanks for coming out, and Anthony. I look forward to your uh, response. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, in the first place, I'd like to reply to the things that you stated that you went on for quite a long time there. Uh, if I forget to come back to your question about how I've been treated, uh, just remind me. Uh, you said, for example, that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament can be equated, uh, equated with uh, the role of Muhammad in the Quran. And yet you can't show us in the Quran where Muhammad identifies himself as Allah. In fact, you even made it clear that Muhammad always clearly distinguishes between himself and, Yah uh, and Allah for whom he is speaking. The angel of Yahweh only or almost never does this. The only example you're giving us is from Zechariah chapter 1, which only shows that he is a distinct person 
from another one who is called Yahweh. In every other case, he simply speaks on his own behalf, and he speaks as Yahweh, as I've said repeatedly, and is called Yahweh, addressed as Yahweh, and receives uh, the worship of Yahweh. Uh, in fact, no sacrifices are offered to Muhammad. He doesn't tell people to remove their shoes and prostrate before him. Uh, this is an act of worship. This is what's done towards the angel of the Lord in Exodus chapter 3, uh, and it's what's done to the angel of the Lord in Joshua chapter 5. Uh, you didn't address those texts. In fact, you keep going back to Balaam, a text that I haven't uh, based much of my argument upon, uh, although I could. Now, uh, interesting thing here, you, 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 again, you rest a lot of your claims on the fact that he's called a melach, a messenger, which I have shown is a term that has no ontological value or import. The term itself is functional. It's only telling us that the person is coming with a message. It doesn't tell us anything about that person's nature. It's used for men in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 32, verse 3. It's used for the wind in Psalm 104.4. The fact that the word angel is used doesn't tell us anything about what kind of being is in view. In fact, if the word angel uh, necessarily hierarchy and that the being being referred to as a messenger indicates that that being is necessarily less than uh, God himself, then I'd like you to put two things together. In fact, well, we're going to end here, but I put this to you for your reflection and for our future discussion, which you've asked me to, uh, uh, to dialogue with you on. Uh, you, uh, in the Quran, and you've made this point already, you've said that the Quran is the direct speech of Allah, right? Muhammad is reciting the direct speech of Allah, so it's not the word of a created being, which for you is always a messenger, is always a created being. So my question for you would be, how do you account for the Quran statement when it says that the Quran is the word of a noble messenger? If the Quran is 100% the direct words of Allah, and the Quran states that it is the word of a noble messenger, not the word of a, uh, <laughs> a mere uh, uh, creature, uh, I'd like you to, when we get to uh, our future discussion, I'd like to dialogue with you on that. Um, so, in conclusion, I just say that the angel does not merely speak on behalf of God, but receives the worship due to God. Moses and Joshua both worship him. Oh, let me uh, point this out as well. You said that in Judges 6, the angel does not, in fact, uh, receive the sacrifice from the hands of Gideon. This is not correct. Here's what Gideon says. He says, if now I have found favor in your sight, he's speaking to the angel, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Gideon is seeking confirmation that it's really the Lord. Gideon asks the angel to wait until he returns with a mincha in Hebrew, a present, a word that could either refer to a feast or to a meat offering for God, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1. Now, the significance of this uh, is captured by Matthew Henry. A mincha is a word that is used which signifies uh, two different things. It could even either be, uh, uh, if you will, uh, a, a gift to a person or it can be an offering. What Gideon's doing here is he wants the angel to distinguish between this offering that is being given to him as either a act of worship or a mere act of reverence. Right? That's that's the, the idea, that's what's going on here. The fact that the angel receives it as as a sacrifice rather than as a meal, that is he doesn't eat it, is an indication that he's receiving it as a sacrifice. Remember that Gideon's doing this to de to determine who in fact this person is who's speaking to him. If now I have found favor in your sight, show me a sign that it's you who speak with me. And the sign is that he receives it as an offering, not as a mere uh, meal. Uh, so you're simply incorrect on that. But uh, anyways, it, oh, uh, I, okay, in answer to your question, yes, I do think I was treated fairly. I think this was a good debate. Uh, I'm happy with how things went. Uh, my statements regarding treatment of Christians in this room or others of this sort like it uh, in the past are based on what we have recorded. Uh, Keith Self had a debate in this, uh, or in at least one of the Muslim rooms here, and was dotted and consistently interrupted, uh, and so that was part of my concern. That's why I insisted that Waduha uh, was the moderator of this debate, because my experiences with Waduha uh, have always been good. Maduha may not know me uh, under this name, uh, but I have interacted in this room, Waduha, in the past. Uh, so I thank you. I, it was a great debate. I thank you, Calling Christians, and I would look forward to discussing this with you more in the future. Uh, Mike is free.
All right, fantastic. Uh, we certainly appreciate both of the debaters at this time. We will uh, give mics to all. We do have some hands up. Anyone who anyone who can stay, please stay. Uh, uh, let's see, the last question was for whom? I've forgotten who the question was for. Oh, it was Royalson's question to uh, calling Christians, right? You're quite welcome. All the guests are welcome and the members know they're welcome. Um, so I think... Um, yes, it's fantastic. Alright, go ahead, uh, drop the stand. Go ahead and take the mic. Yellow. Yellow. Assalamu alaikum. Is this debate over? Can we just, uh, it's, the question period is over, right? Or can we still ask questions? Uh, yeah, I have a, <clears throat> oh, I can, huh? Hmm. You know, I was going to say, um, uh, is it possible that somebody can explain to me um, how somebody can see God, how somebody cannot see God, yet at, this, yet at the same time they saw God. Well, the Bible says no man can see God, uh, and at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, um, the person sees sees God. Um, I don't understand that. <clears throat> anyway, next on Mike. I'll be back. I have something more to say, but... Um, you want me to repeat the question? Okay, anyway, next on Mike. Can you hear me? One, can you hear me? Sorry, so basically I just wanted to just quickly give a answer, uh, answer to that question. It's actually a really good question. So basically what he was saying, the gentleman earlier, is that what he was seeing, okay, is, is true. For example, many different texts, like Exodus 33 and others, if you see God, you, 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 you would not be able to live, right? The point of this is, is that we can't see God in his, in his, in all his glory, in his, in his complete perfect um, internal form, uh, in the sense that, because God is internal, obviously, right? And this is what the scripture tells us. You can't, um, this is why, for example, the main text that I can put in the room here to really, um, to really focus on is this text here. It's going to keep things one at a time. It's a little bit easier to keep things one at a time. Exodus 3 3. This kind of gives you a little bit, it's kind of like the nucleus, okay, of of a lot of, of the different, explain a lot of different theophanies as to what goes on in the Hebrew scripture. So basically, the back parts, he asks, Moshe asks to see God. And what does he do? He gives him a response, right? He sees his glory, but he sees, and, and how, how is that metaphorically described? How is God's glory metaphorically described in Exodus 33? As his back parts. Okay, he's seeing God indirectly, right? Um, and so basically this is what's happening here is, is, is the, the, the glory is basically the Shekhinah in the Hebrew, okay? It's the divine presence known as the Nur in Arabic or light. What we're seeing with this, this angel that you see repeatedly, whether it's in Exodus 3, Genesis 18, Genesis 16, Judges 13, Judges 6, is you're seeing the light of God that's being manifested in this Moloch. Okay, as he's functioning as a representative that's standing on behalf of Yod Hevav Hei. So he's, he's basically an agent par excellence. What it basically means is, okay, it's not like David and others, Moshe, Moses and others who are agents as well, but the angel is the representative of God par excellence. In other words, he is the possessor of that divine presence. In Arabic, you would call it nur, light. Okay, and so basically the only way, this is the, one of the ways in which God actually spoke to people in the Hebrew scriptures at times, 